doing? Have you have you seen the the teeth one? What? There's a Pokemon <laughs> teeth brushing app. Oh, uh, that is genius. And so, that is genius. you know, one of, one of my best friends is a dentist. And so we were all around at hers once and we downloaded it. And it's basically at, you're battling Pokemon as you're brushing your teeth. And then at the end, you get like a little Pokemon hat that AR puts on you. And it's really cute. And you're like, that's so good for kids. It's so like, oh, yes, perfect. for kids. <laughs> is your Pikachu? You, you Thunderbolt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I choose you. Right. The government is going to be releasing like Pokemon taxes soon oh. <laughs> to get people to submit their taxes, Team and they get Pokemon Pikachu if they get the them polls. in. On that's oh wait, right. I'm trying to think. Like, Pokey, go to the polls. That's it. That's it. I'm trying to think of like what would be an H and R Block version of Pokemon, which is the the tax people over here, or Turbo. We have those tax Turbo people. tax. I don't know Pokemon well no. enough. <laughs> yeah, but neither do I. Anyway, welcome Tur Turtle Tax. There we go. Sorry. No, I like it. I like it. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Friends Per Second podcast. Uh, every couple of weeks, four good pals get together and talk about video games for their sins. Uh, I'm hosting this My name is Lucy. Uh, and around the room, we've got Ralph, aka Skill Up. Hello. Hello. Jake Baldino. Dude, did I say anything bad about Pokemon in that? I didn't know we were recording. <laughs> We were definitely we recording. Were recording. The Pokemon. I, we were doing the nah, bands and going into the intro. Did I disparage Pokemon? I don't want to. No, uh, you can, uh, though. Go to Poke Jail. Please no, do. I, I do I all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't finished a Pokemon game since Pokemon Red, so I don't give a shit. That's a good one. Yeah. That's the last so. good one, maybe. That's a long time ago, man. No. That's like, what is that? Like, tw what is that? Twenty years now? <laughs> hey, <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> hey, hey have a hold on, Lucy. You haven't played a Pokemon game? No, I haven't finished one. I have played them. Yeah, I'm with you on that. You're talking to the completionist. No, no, I'm talking to the completionist, Gerard. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I am the completionist, Gerard. I'm in a hotel room. <laughs> I'm not in my normal setup, so I apologize for headphone users if I get a little crazy loud, but I'm happy to be You sound great. Which, uh, which, which, which city are you in and what are you doing there? I'm in Chicago filming a secret project that I can't talk about yet. Okay. I love That's the exciting. town. Was that Chicago? No. <laughs> <laughs> that is not Chicago. Even I know that that is not Chicago. Okay? <laughs> that would work if you were there last week with Gabe when he was talking about setting up a new studio for CD Projekt Red. Not this. Oh, not this. <laughs> Oh, I love it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway. I love you. Um, in my defense, I'm not from this fair country. <laughs> um, Anyway. Neither is neither is Ralph. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like I was gonna say anything, you know. I don't, I don't even live there. Oh. So anyway, the accents are both harsh. It's yeah. they, they both have. Harsh I love that. A's. Yeah. Yeah. I love any of the the stuff that those boys work on, like uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and stuff. When they do the whole like Southy accent and they oh, feel yeah. like lean into it, I love all that shit, man. I love it. I love it so much. I don't know why. I just do. Did you pack your car? Yeah, all that shit. I love yeah. that stuff. Just anything. I want, I want a whole. I want a. <laughs> I want a whole TV series. It's just all those people just talking like that, like Seinfeld, but with that accent, dude. <laughs> there would be like that would be the perfect television for me, hundred percent. Oh well, we've got oh, a lot well. to talk about. Not to do with television, I'm afraid. Um, a yeah, lot of video busy. game stuff. Oh my god, I've started like time blocking my calendar after work to try and fit all the games in, like. For an hour here, I will play Cyberpunk or, or Assassin's Creed or whatever. And so, yeah, it's getting serious. It's release season. So let's let's kick off it with uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage, which came out. Rip the Band-Aid off here. I mean, mm -mm. I finished it last night. Or was it last night or the <laughs> night before? I think it was the night before. No and spoilers. No spoilers. No spoilers. Um... But what? what? <laughs> <laughs> it was funny in the Discord. You were like, "What the fuck was that, Andy?" <laughs> you know? no, my favorite thing was I finished it first, and then Ralph, you were like, "Oh, I'm just about to do the final thing," <laughs> and then like two hours later, you were like, "What the fuck was that ending?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Like, yeah. legitimately, what the fuck is that ending? I mean, beyond um, the, well, I mean, we're obviously not going to talk about the ending. 
um, because in any great detail. But I just want to give a shout out to Barrett from Kind of Funny because I DM'd him and he immediately sent me an explainer. And I was like, okay, that kind of makes like sense now. Manifesto. <sighs> yeah, it's like that. A, a crazy Assassin's Creed fan. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I get it. <laughs> well, I mean, Jake, you are a crazy Assassin's Creed fan. Yeah, so what, I, what but like think? I'm one that has checked out of the lore along. Like I keep trying, but yeah. uh, blah, blah, blah. so just to start off, um, I am on record as being the annoying guy about these games where I can understand that the new trilogy of games, the ones that went super massive mm -hmm. action RPG, I understand that like they are good for people and some people really like them and they're doing incredibly well for Ubisoft. They're breaking records like that. That's Assassin's Creed now. But I really like the weird old fucked up ones. Even the most flawed <laughs> ones. Even <laughs> Unity, Rogue. Like I I love there was nothing else really like them. So they made me happy. So I was kind of eating up the whole like, oh, Mirage is gonna be a little bit of a return to roots, a, 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 a return to the basics. Emphasis on stealth, hiding in crowds, sitting on a bench, just you know, just <laughs> yeah. stuff. I love sitting on a bench. <laughs> but uh yeah. Yeah, it, it, Valhalla teased some of this stuff. Valhalla had little tiny elements of yes. this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and this was intended to be a DLC type of thing at first, kind of expanding on Basim. Uh, but it kind of feels like not really a full return to form. It feels a little bit more like they made the new modern Assassin's Creed smaller, took away the combat, made it bad, made you sneak around more. <laughs> And something's not quite there. Something's a little sure. lost in translation yeah. where like, I think if you've only played the new ones, you play this, you might go, oh, this is like a little different. This is like a little spinoff one. But like, if you come into it, like if you're a player like me, it's going to start off pretty cool. Like, wow. All right, we're doing this because it knows what it's doing. It's like you have a white hood. You're in the Middle East. It's it's classic assassins. Their the, uniforms look like Altai Altaïrs. No, the opening but, is very like there are some beats that are just oh, yeah. lifted from older games. I was yeah, and yeah, I like and it, I, it I dug the beginning for sure. Even the, the first time you like you know pay some pay some dudes to go like distract the guards mm -hmm. and then you like slip in walking yeah, yeah, yeah. like you're just walking with everybody and I'm like oh hell yeah dude mm -hmm. but then like as it goes on the luster wears off and it doesn't really. It's just like dead simple. It's not totally. totally. Yeah. It's not. It's not like doing anything terribly. Yes. But it's not really doing anything very exciting. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's so when totally I was agree. playing. I was like so thrilled they were going back to basics, and I loved the beginning. Like when we were all playing, we were chatting about it. And we were all just like, "Oh yeah, the, you know, the beginning is great. Like it's 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 Assassin's Creed's back, baby." The question, the thing that I was thinking about is. Did I want Assassin's Creed to go back to what it was, or do I just want it to be 2007 again? Because I think <laughs> I'm looking at the older Assassin's Creed, certainly with rose-tinted glasses, or at least the new one, Mirage, in stripping back from what Assassin's Creed has become, Mirage is this weird, uh, what's the word, facsimile? I can't remember how to say that word. Yeah. I have only, I've only ever read it trying to sound smart. <laughs> of like this hybrid between the old and the new because there is still some sort of like yes. modern bullshit in there that like, I, I think for example, I think maybe this is just how I'm remembering it, but I think Basim controls horribly. Really? I, th I, I think, think he controls no, I think he, really well. He sticks, yeah, I had a lot of issues. He sticks on everything and he sticks on the wrong things. And that's really frustrating when they are saying, oh, like there's this emphasis on parkour. That really frustrates me. But anyway, the thing that I think that really got me is that like back in 2007 to 2012, when Assassin's Creed for me, those are my favorite ones. That, that was perfect for me because I didn't know a life like Hitman 3. And unfortunately, <laughs> when you go to the black box missions in Mirage and they've been bigging those up and like, yeah, multiple ways to get your targets. Yeah, yeah. There's not, there's two. And it's usually very uninteresting. And there is usually no creative problem solving. I think the thing that really gets me is that like, totally. I was in a courtyard and there were these two guards and they were guarding a door. So I was like, well, something clearly has to be behind that door. I go up and I kill them both. 
and it's a door that doesn't open. It's a fake door. <laughs> And I was like, well, fuck I me, what was that? So much. And then yes, totally. the other thing is like, yeah, not being able to, the only time I ever did any creative problem solving was there was a trap door and I was like, hmm, can't open that, can't attack it, can't do anything. But nearby, like down a level, there was some explosive barrels. So I was like, I wonder if that would explode. And it did. Yes. Nothing to do with the mission. It was a collectible. I remember that bit. I remember that yeah. same. Yep. Like, that was the actually right. That was the only time where that kind of puzzle existed that I found. Mm -hmm. And yes, I was like disappointed that in that because even going around, I wanted to be the assassin. I wanted to be using the environment. I wanted to, you know, and, and, and like just, just blending in, just doing this or that didn't give me that feeling. Also, I think the token economy is completely busted and I did not care. For it. <laughs> yeah. It sucked. Yes. But otherwise, like, there was something really comforting in a way. Like I know how the AI in Assassin's Creed works and reacts. And I thought it was kind of funny that the AI is so forgiving, enemy AI. Uh, like I would, I was in a hay bale and Stu, I'll send you this footage because it's quite funny. I was in a hay bale, you whistle, only one person comes. They'll all get notified, mm. but only one comes over. Yeah. And then I kill them, drag them into the hay bale. They yeah. all don't get alerted. And then I just whistle again and one more yes. comes over, but they're all alerted. And I did like five of them in one go. <laughs> and I was like, Yes, no, that's it. Exactly right. Yeah. It felt uh, comforting yeah. in a way. Yeah, because it's never been like it's never been like incredible. No. Like, but there's something so I just want to Well, I don't to, like, agree, by the way. I, I'm just gonna I'd interrupt you. Really? I'm just gonna say, well, Assassin's Creed 4 was incredible, right? I oh, Black believe Flag? that Assassin's yeah. Creed 4 Black but, Flag oh. was incredible, right? But, but for reasons that we're not talking and pulling. Totally and agree. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Not not that stuff, for sure, yeah. for sure, for sure. But but I think sorry, you I would cut you off. So you go, you go. Okay, sorry, just the only thing I wanted to just jump off of Lucy's example, uh that for me was kind of indicative of a lot of the game was when you said you encountered two guards out in the street standing in front of something. And it's like, Oh, that's gotta be something. So that's it, it even to me goes back to Assassin's Creed two, where Assassin's Creed two is the first one where you'd stumble upon two guys guarding something, but they were guarding something that was actually worthwhile mm -hmm. or like you really wanted to get it. And also usually it was being guarded by one or two guys that were like scary mm -hmm. and you had to like figure out how to actually really get around them. And this game doesn't like have little things like that. So it was kind of like building up a lot of things where I'm like, yeah, but the old one did it better, but the old one did it better. Yeah. I yes. sound like a broken record. I don't need it to just be the same game. I'm going to contradict myself a lot, but I think that's like a good example. Like, but I think, I think that's what this game is, though. It is like it contradicts itself a lot. I think in the way mm -hmm. that it promises to be a return to basics, but it hasn't done it in a particularly fun or interesting way and still yeah. has the modern shit in it like well because it's still I, like I, it's still like uh, you know it's still a modern one it's still yeah. a, a scaled back modern assassin's creed i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna be the politician here at the podium <laughs> i'm just asking the questions that is, uh -huh. that 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 uh, uh representative khalil from california <laughs> uh did not get a code for assassin's creed mirage uh when you say that it suffers from modern bullshit. Could you clarify for the audience what that means? Because when you say modern, mm. I, I don't, my brain goes into like overdrive because we've had at this point three different versions of what the fucking Assassin's Creed game is. And at the time of their release, they were considered modern. So like in yeah, my mind, point. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that means. So what, what, what is the modern stuff that like, could you give me a more specific example that of like, what that means the story <laughs> but even so, that i don't think that's quite no, fair because no, no, i think no, that, like, like i think this story is so bad it's way worse than anything that the new trilogy mm. provided right so i actually think this is a massive step down versus what those modern assassin creed games were offering and i also don't think that the story was like really incredible in the previous ac games either like let's be real i don't think that was I think a two, point. two and brotherhood sure, sure, they, but yeah. like i guess they stuck longer because it's um you know. Ezio. Yeah, my sweet boy. Um, I think the modern, for me, when I think modern um, AC, it's really about the fact that it's not focused upon assassins or stealth or assassinations. Mm. It's got this massive gear game in it. Like it's ultimately about action, com like ability driven action combat. And I, so I, I don't quite agree that it's like, I think when people say 
from what I've seen. Mm-hmm. I think when people say like, oh, it's it's got those modern things, it's like, well, you can see the engine. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't like the parkour. They feel like it was better in the older games, particularly in Unity. And this still has the older parkour system. Right, sorry, excuse me. This has the modern parkour mm-hmm. system from the recent yeah. trilogy. Um, in terms of overall visual presentation as well, it's got like the, the new trilogy whatever they're doing with it faces look really bad like really terrible okay thank you i didn't i didn't want to like i don't want to feel like i'm going ham on this because i finished it like i i had a good time i had yeah i'm kind of like yeah i said it's okay but when i was great but but when i was like playing it and like every single cutscene, every side character i was like okay well there are at least four characters who got the treatment of like re but i feel like i wonder if even NPCs who you talk to and interact with, like none of them looked particularly good. It's very bad. It's it's very bad. Animations like the, were the not game great overall. Either, and it was- yeah, the game overall looks really nice, but the facial stuff is just super outdated at this point, mm. and it's just it really holds those games back because they're trying to have characters and storyline. It's uh, failing abysmally, but it's trying to do it right. But then you've got these faces that look just really bad. And look, I haven't played Starfield, but I've seen footage of starfield and obviously that's something that holds back bethesda games like there's a general expectation now when it comes to faces you play something like cyberpunk and you're just like damn man that's incredible we played you know obviously guardians of the galaxy which we'll meant to mention later in the episode when we interview interview um interview ben but like incredible facial animations on that and it really mm. makes a difference with regards to storytelling um and then to be sort of like slapped back into really janky unexpressive awkward looking faces that kind of just look waxy and pasted on like shora agdashalu her her character model in game is just it doesn't look good do you know what i mean like it doesn't look like a believable actual human being um and yeah i just think ubisoft really need to invest in this sort of stuff because they're always trying to tell stories with characters but they're the tech they're using has just fallen way behind at this point for sure for sure i think Um, but i mean like i think no you go you go no, you go. I haven't finished formulating my thought. Well, I was going to say, I just think it's 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 hard to talk about this game because uh, like people, because I'm like, okay, my review was net negative. Okay, I don't recommend this game personally. But there are some things about it that I like. And in particular, what I like is it going back to the old formula, right? I do like the fact that there's almost no loot game. I do like the fact that you can assassinate anyone in one kill. I do like the fact that it's st- focused on stealth as opposed to full frontal combat. Yes. I don't mind the odd escort mission here and there because they actually like, you know, they don't overdo it. It's fine. And it's mm-hmm. it sinks me into the fantasy. I don't mind one location because I'm like, well, I get to learn about this place and feel immersed in it rather than just spending two minutes in it. And then immediately I'm on horseback riding to the next place, right? So those core elements I really liked. Mm-hmm. But- if I wanted those things, I could just go back and play the old Assassin's Creed games. Do you know what I mean? And I'd have a better time doing it, I think, in most aspects. So, like, what I really wanted out of this was those essential elements, but you're building a new... And again, this is where the conversation becomes frustrating because you're building a new experience, right? You're taking those things and you're building a new type of Assassin's Creed game using those building blocks. But then people come back and they say, well, what do you want? You want something new? You just said you wanted something old. And it's like, no, those are not mutually exclusive. You know what I mean? Like you want some the old building blocks that are focused on stealth, and assassination and parkour, but you also want them modernized. You want some new ideas. You want to see where this like formula could go in the future rather than just like being back, stuck back in the past. Yeah, for me- And that's made this conversation really, I think, quite frustrating online because mm. I talk about it in my review and, and then everyone is sort of like mischaracterizing it. Like, oh man, you shat all over the new games wanting the old one and then they give you the old one and now you shit on that too. It's like, it's like it's well- black it's and white, yeah. No. It's not that, you know what I mean? I really wonder so- what Assassin's Creed would- So they've also done a Marvel style intro. Um, they have- you yeah. know, and it's, I didn't realize it's 15 years of Assassin's Creed. And I wonder at this point if like, I, what would a, what would an Assassin's Creed game be if it wasn't tied to, I mean, they've, they've, if it wasn't tied to synchronizing viewpoints, if it wasn't tied to certain mission styles, if it wasn't even tied to parkour, if it wasn't tied to stuff, like what, what could Assassin's Creed be if it let go of its past completely? And I think I'm at the point now where I've played so many of them that going back to basics going back to original is fun but like 
What's the next stage from here? Like, I know that Clint Hawking's working on, is it Hex and there's Jade and there's whatever. Is it all going to be like some variation of this formula forever? Because Ubisoft is too risk averse to do something really drastic? See, I see it quite differently in the sense that I think the premise of your question is like, well, if this is all that it is, there, like, it should. What, what could? What else could it be that's different? Mm. And I actually don't agree because the way I see it is when I play this game, I'm like, I think those core elements still hold up. I actually don't think, like, I think it is an interesting question to explore what this franchise could be, other than like a big, massive open world loot driven RPG, which we know that it is in mm-hmm. large part, and it's going to continue to be that, right? But then obviously you've spoken about like Hitman and that it really appeals to you in terms of what if it was closer to that immersive sim style thing where you're stealthily solving solving problems with emergent gameplay and puzzle solving and all that sort of stuff. I think that, that's a really cool angle. And I think that's ex- worth exploring as an option for what this could be. But I think bringing it back in a more strict sense to what Assassin's Creed Mirage is and what I hoped it might be, I'm not looking for it to be something vastly different than what it is. I'm just looking for those core things that are there to work well, which they do. Yeah. But to, well, I think those things are kind of good, the core things, right? But then it's like, what do you do after I've experienced them for the first two hours? Because once you've mm-hmm. played two hours of this game, you have seen it all. You have seen every mechanic. You've seen every location, sort of like you've seen the story beats. You've seen every enemy type. I mean, there's like, there's fucking like two <laughs> enemy types in this game. There's like the little guys and the fat guys. And then there's flamethrower oh, dudes. Oh, there's flamethrower who- guy. There's like, you never even see them. And then it's like, they have flamethrowers. Why aren't they like, Flame throwing the brush so you can't hide in it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and the what thing is, is going well, on like, here? Even, you know? even your tool set, like massively paring that down. I didn't. Oh, even, I actually like that. I did that too, I but that was I brave. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even unlock like the noisemaker. Oh yeah. Sure. I was, like, you don't need them. I don't need it because yeah, I've got. Th- need, I've got throwing knives. You don't need all of it. And smoke correct, bombs. Correct. That's all I need. So, I really feel like sorry Gerard I apologize I'm just gonna finish my point because okay. <laughs> because okay. I'm just like but I, I really feel like those things work and I actually don't want and I don't think we should like throw the baby out with the bathwater so mm. to speak it's really just about like I think Mirage should have taken those things and done some more interesting things with them because that gameplay loop it 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 like endures it really does it's just Mirage doesn't showcase that at all so yeah. I liked the uncovering my, the mystery and <laughs> figuring out like yes. who is who and I thought that was really cool I think the way that they tie well, all of the the missions together is a way more interesting structure than just you know following Ezio as you know cutscene to killing I, someone I, I totally I really disagree enjoyed with that it. you did I totally just dis- oh my god you yes didn't that like was the it? part of the game that I absolutely I hated liked the most it. I <laughs> sorry to, sorry to disagree but like I no because I was like I just felt like I was being daisy chained led by the nose from one mm-hmm. anonymous target to the next I have no idea who anyone is until five minutes before it's time to kill them yeah and then oh. That's the bad guy. Fair enough. Had no idea. Guess I'll go assassinate you now. And they're just on and on it goes. And I just felt so uninvested by the by the virtue of that structure. For me, that was what I mean, actually killed the game more than anything else. I was gonna say, I think I think that's totally fair saying you're uninvested because you're totally right. Because I don't give a shit who these people are. I just I'm just. It was more that I know that that's the goal, and there was satisfaction in seeing the clues come together and figuring out who it was. But you know. Going back in like the Borgia, for example, in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, that was cool because you were like, oh, I know exactly, you know, this family sucks. I've got to go back and kill them. So there's, <laughs> there's two different ways of doing it. I think that sure. is what I enjoyed about the structure of this one. And it like kind of gave you some agency in choosing your path, but not sure. not too much. I but- sorry, Gerard. We keep cutting. We keep cutting Gerard. We got Gerard, yeah, Gerard off. <laughs> <laughs> no, continue. I, I'm try. I'm good, Jake. Say what you're <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, like, things I like about the game is yeah. the fact that Ubisoft at least said, okay, stealth, and yes. all right, we're gonna do what we did back in the old, specifically like Assassin's Creed One. It's like we're gonna make the combat not good, specifically <laughs> yeah. because it's not the point. Like you're supposed to yeah. be stealthing, and th- that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I actually like, and it, this is like a weird thing, like. It's like, I feel like the combat, when you do have to do it here, it doesn't feel great. But on the other end, I really liked even Assassin's Creed 1's combat because you would just wait for someone to strike, you'd parry, and then do a yeah. cool counterattack that just instantly kills them, and it's a cool finisher. And it does that again here. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow, the fact that they actually like 
are okay with that and like they they put stealth in the game where ubisoft again like it came up seems risk averse uh i like that they at least had some of this but yeah. i really think the story was the bigger downer for me like i liked some side characters i didn't hate basm but a lot of the side character stuff goes away and then you know halfway through you're like all right well, so we're I think, never gonna get a da vinci back you know no <laughs> my biggest hot take i think i'll have is that i and people are sick of the r word but like reboot Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Whoa. Sorry. Whoa. Um, uh, wow. This is like a <laughs> Jake's cancellation. <laughs> so is this right? This is like a Linus Reboot. Tech Tips moment. You know? Wait. What is that? Which? What is that word again? <laughs> yeah. Uh, reboot Assassin's Creed. I think it's time because specifically when we were talking about story, I was literally just sitting here having a brain blast in real life, like thinking about playing Assassin's Creed 1, playing Assassin's Creed 2, and you'd finish a mission, and then all of a sudden the Animus would come up, and you'd be like, fuck yes, what's going to happen mm. next? Or at least me. I liked all the sci-fi stuff at the start, and I was like, what's going to happen next? Yeah! So I haven't had that feeling in a long time in an Assassin's Creed game. So yeah. I want something I mean, like I, that, I, especially with the deeper, the big picture lore. I think, if anything, that's what needs to be. And they've tried. Layla Hassan was all right, but like they really need to redo yeah. it. Yeah, I, I agree. It would be interesting to pursue that similar to what, again, like what Lucy was saying with like Hitman. Like, what if you did strip this back and made it sort of an immersive sim style experience? Like, that would totally be a cool angle for how this game could be. It would be really hard to, for Ubisoft to pull it off, but they could do something like that if they had the appetite for it. Then, or it's always going to be this massive RPG going forward now because the those that trilogy was so spectacularly successful for ubisoft there's no way they're getting off that anytime soon but yeah and a, a reboot yeah i mean like and that's the thing right that's the conversation we're having now we're not saying like oh mirage successfully reset the formula i'm really looking forward to mirage 2 for example where they just do more of this because they they found it we're like nah man this is not it like this still needs this was this a still weird little diversion this to is, try and distract a, the old school totally works. and it was yeah. meant totally, to be dlc totally. Like to play was, Devil's it Advocate, it was meant to be DLC that they kind of spun out into a uh, a bigger product. Where where is the innovation, man? Where back yes. in the they were like, what if you could take your hood off and then put a top hat on instead? <gasps> oh, <laughs> we don't see that anymore. No, no, no. Like the costumes thing was the disappointing bit for me. You couldn't like, really. They were very situational and only well, there was like only two, two. Or three missions. There was yeah, only two, missions, two yeah. different costumes. And when I got that trophy that said, oh, you you used both the costumes, I was like, oh, well, you yeah, had a whole game where costuming and changing and blending in was the so whole limited. thing. And that kind of, I'd rather you didn't put it in if you're not going to yeah. fully commit to it as a mechanic. Um, but anyway. Okay, so I haven't played this game, obviously. Okay. So I have I have played a lot of these Assassin's Creed games, mm -hmm. like almost all of them, at least up until the most recent reboot. So just just so we're all on the same page, mainline games. So we're all on the same page. There's Assassin's Creed One, Two, Brotherhood, Revelations, Assassin's Creed Three, Black Flag, Rogue, Unity, Syndicate. That's nine games. No. Then they said we're gonna change it. We got Don't forget origins. about liberation. Yeah, but I'm oh, yeah, talking about little, like, I'm talking about that, oh, that's mainline, a, that's that's considered mainline yeah. mainline. It okay. did come to it did come to consoles eventually, but Far that's cry. that that's rogue. Yeah, freedom cry, right. freedom cry, freedom cry, freedom cry. That's D the DLC. Um, then we had Origins, mm -hmm. Odyssey, and mm -hmm. Valhalla. So now, just to like, just so we're all, just so I've mapped it out for everyone. We've had three games in which they redid, they they changed it all, versus nine where it was like just progressively evolving, for lack of a better term, until we were like, all right, it's time to move on from Assassin's Creed. But now, what I'm hearing from you guys is they went back to basics, but they did poorly on going back to basics. And Jake, if I'm not mistaken, you're like, I wish they did better going back to basics because you missed that format. I guess I'm just a little confused and lost because I feel like, don't get me wrong, Odyssey, Valhalla, uh, Origins, those games were not for me. I did not like those games at all because they were massive for the sake yeah. of being massive. They were large yes. for the sake of 
everyone's game has to be an hour long, a uh, hundred hour plus collectathon RPG, uh, break a tree down, turn it into a ship kind of vibe, right? That's like <laughs> what everyone, that's what like Tears of the Kingdom did and, and Breath of the Wild, and now everyone's doing that whole thing, right? Um, but it's I guess the question I have for you guys is: Is three games enough to then warrant to want to go back to to what it was before? And if so, what is the innovation that's there? Because again, I haven't played this new one yet. I I have no preconceptions about what it is. In my opinion, I think it was weird that they decided to make a sequel to Valhalla that was also a reboot or a reimagining of what the original combat was. So I, I don't know. Well, what is the answer here? Because I feel like we got nine games of improvement over time, despite all the bugs and whatnot. Yeah, it's like we talk crap time. about them as they as they improved. They were like, yeah, but... Uh, right, you know. right. Like, there are elements <laughs> that sucked, right? Like, they, they I, I'm with you, Jake. They ditched all the Animus stuff. That stuff was the most interesting part for me. I wanted the Assassin's Creed trilogy to end with Desmond being like... And now we're modern day, and I know yeah. everything because I use the animus, and I understand. Instead, like that was not what yeah, Assassin's people Creed made fun was. of me for liking it. <laughs> right? No, they still I'm, make fun I'm, of you for liking it. I'm, I'm with you, but then a black flag was like, "Hey, the animus part—it's first person for like a few seconds, and we're gonna forget about it. We're fucking pirates. That's sick. Let's talk about yeah. pirates for this game. And then <laughs> Let's now it talk na- about pirates. Now, That's now it's pitch. now it's fucking <laughs> Lay Miz time. Fucking Viva la Rus- yeah. <laughs> Revolution. That's awesome." And then the weird faces and day one issues. And then Syndicate, which it's still I'm That's broken my record. Fave. Yeah. It's the fucking best. The goddamn Jack the Ripper DLC is one of the best yeah. things I've ever experienced. Um so in my opinion, like Assassin's Creed did get better from the beginning. It's just that, like Ralph kind of said, the story shit, the modernization of the story stuff deteriorated over time. So when they rebooted Origins, I was like, okay, cool. We're gonna like try it again and start fresh the first assassin kind of vibe uh i got tired like eight mm-hmm. hours in I was yeah, like, this, yeah, yeah. Is, this is and all of them have felt that way so yeah. to me mirage was like okay cool i'm going back to that that it's that comfort brain right of tur- it's it's the far cry model climb the tower synchronize and it oh, feels yeah. good on my brain that i did that but there was <laughs> also improvements along the way so i guess the question i have for you guys is when you want this reboot, Jake, or if there is room for a reboot, what what is the what is the solution? Is it to reboot the very first Assassin's Creed game and restart the Desmond trilogy, or is it fucking modernize it and it's happening today and we adapt all the old combat into into Altair is the is the key point. Like what where where's I, the line? Where where do I we think start? It's got to be a new strong through line. Like it has to have a strong core animus story. Uh, people really like Desmond. So like it needs, I I think Assassin's Creed for me, like on paper, the pitch was like cool ancient times. You're going, you're living, you're reliving memories, but then sometimes you're jumping out and you're living this kind of modern sci-fi adventure. So I feel it like it needs that. But the bigger thing, and I think like the braver thing is for Ubisoft to commit to it being some sort of fun hybrid stealth game with its own unique spins, the social stealth stuff. It doesn't have to be, a hitman or a thief dark project or anything like that but its own modern accessible stealth thing and they've done it before uh you know they've they've pioneered with stuff like splinter cell and then they even tried to modernize splinter cell with blacklist Mm. and conviction and Mm. i like they were accessible they were a little easier to play but i still thought they were generally kind of cool and they found their audiences so i would almost like to see ubisoft kind of go back to that and double down on that. Mm. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. I think the answer is Black Flag 2. <laughs> yeah. I think well, let me tell you about that, Skull and Bones. Let me tell you about a game called <laughs> <laughs> That <laughs> is not it. Yeah. Come on now. Let's be real. That is not it. No, but I'm actually not joking. I reckon if you made yeah. Assassin's Creed Black Flag 2, it would be have fucking incredible. Have you guys, have we, we've went to bars up. and we've, we've went drinking enough. Have I given you my pitch or no about this whole thing? No. No, they no, sh- no, no they should have. They should have done a whole complete spinoff and call it Pirate's Total. Creed. Total. And then you have oh, a shit ton of cool yeah. Pirate's games. Yeah. Dude, that is it. And there's actually there's rumors that uh, four is being remade after they're done with Skull and Bones. They're just going to move on to a four remake, which 
I'm fine with that. Beautiful. I'll take it as a starting point. And then the after that, I agree. When sea shanties went on TikTok. <laughs> people were like, oh, wow, that's oh that yeah. was the moment. I The sea shanties when you were playing four, oh my God, oh God. it was the best Sally thing Brown, ever. The the gal gal like, oh, whiskey. Oh, oh my God, God. I love that. It's just it was so, good. so these are the memories that I think we have with those sorts of old games that really stand Even out. And I guarantee you, you will not have any of those moments or memories with Mirage. I really guarantee you, it will not happen. And so I'm actually quite surprised at the critical reception to this. I really thought that it would come in a lot close, like closer to like a 65 on Metacritic. I thought there'd be a lot more like descent in terms, or a lot, lot, lot. lot um, I thought the reviews would be harsher, to be perfectly honest. But people like this, and then critics like it. So again, don't take our word for it. You know, we're just one perspective. I think all three of us are kind of cool on it. Uh, go and seek out other perspectives because yeah, there are other plenty of people that have quite liked this and scoring yeah. it eight out or, or yeah. nine out of 10. I can't see that at all. I am genuinely surprised about that, but that is the critical reception on mass, I would say. So again, Except don't take our word. Make sure you check it out. Six Except on, for GameSpot, they did give it a six. That's true. That's true. It's Jordan Remains. But, uh, but it's, it's done yeah. surprisingly well, critically. And I, as I said, I, I, I did expect something a bit different. Yeah. So I, I will yeah. say it's been the one thing I do love about Assassin's Creed Mirage and I, again, this is not playing. It's just me knowing is that there's a lot of um, Middle Eastern and Arab people that are working on this game, and that like yeah. warms my heart as an as a Middle Eastern man. Like being on Twitter, and I follow a lot of developers who are Lebanese or <laughs> or Jordanian or Israeli or Pakistani, whatever. Whatever. Like I, I I follow everyone because like I until a couple of years ago, I didn't realize that there were that many era of people in the games industry. I thought I was like one of maybe two, you know, it was like very, very different. Um, and so to see all these tweets in Arabic being like, yo, we fucking did it. Like, it doesn't matter what the score is. The game came out and people love it. Like that, that to me was like, that's the fucking cool shit. That's the shit that I, I love the most because you see these people who are like, we fucking worked on this shit for months mm -hmm. and months and months. And it like represents us through and through. That's the stuff that I'm like, that's what made me want to pick up Mirage because it just uh, seems and, so oh, cool. No, and, and, like, and to I be think fair, the like setting the, is the setting's really cool, but also being able yeah. to go through and like the compendium of yeah, just yeah, like yeah. it's agree. you know the Middle East is not something that I know too much about. Like I don't know that much about totally. Baghdad, but like going through, I was reading everything. And I was like, oh holy shit, I didn't know this about harms or like the uh, sure. Khalifa and everything. I was like, damn, okay. Yep. So yep. Yeah, I agree. That was, a high I think that was, that was like one what I go to these games for, and like yeah, it does totally. have that. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Mm. Hell yeah. So yeah. Bad time for me to take a drink there because I should have segued <laughs> us very neatly. Um, so last week we had the one hell of a leak, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Poor uh, Phil. You just want to give oh Phil a big hug God. in those moments, don't you? Just be like, it's going to be all right, Phil. Don't the worry. Xbox leaks. The Xbox yeah, yeah. leaks. So what was it again? <laughs> My concept so of time is gone. I can, I, can give you, uh, I can give you the rundown if oh, you like. Yeah. Go on, go on. Okay. All right. So basically, uh, and Xbox's like next five years of plans have been leaked. <laughs> uh, the major things include a refresh of the Xbox Series X. It's called Project Brooklyn, and looks like it an Alexa is. Now. It does look like an Alexa and yeah. it's got, there's no, it's the same specs, but it's got some like power management stuff and whatever, but it has no disk drive. It's all digital, which I suspect we'll talk about. Um, there's a new controller. It's uh, Project Siebel and it basically has uh, the, the haptic feedback that you get on the PS5 controller now available on the Xbox controller, as well as another, some other bells and whistles. The entire lineup for Bethesda for the next few years was leaked. Dishonored revealing 3! Dishonored 3. It's coming, baby. <laughs> Uh, which is a big surprise, but very welcome. Obviously, Arcane Leon are working on that now. Uh, Doom A Year Zero is what it are working on. We don't know what that is, if it's like some throwback reboot thing or if it's like, you know, just a proper straight up sequel to Doom. We're not sure. Uh, Ghostwire Tokyo 2 is coming mm -hmm. um, from Tango Works. That was and a surprise. We know, obviously, that was a big surprise, that but I'm glad surprise. because I'm that one, that had a really cool world mm -hmm. that was worth sticking with. It's just that the gameplay itself wasn't great, yeah. you know? So if they can like tighten up that side of the equation, I think that's... I'm really pleased that they're they're doing they're doing that actually. Um, who am I missing for their studios? Uh, and obviously Bethesda Game Studios is working on Elder Scrolls. No surprises there. We should expect some Starfield DLC next year. Oh, uh, um, what was the? Um, they wanted to buy Nintendo, or at least Phil. Phil they wanted Phil's to buy. Really Phil thought it would be. A, oh, an Oblivion a remaster, moment. maybe. Yes, and Fallout Three remake as well. Yeah. 
Um, so they're confirmed. But uh, yeah, Phil also said that it would be a career moment for him to acquire Nintendo and he feels like Microsoft is best place to do that. That was back in 2020, mind you, he wrote that email. Since then, they've gone on to buy Bethesda mm-hmm. and also buy Activision Blizzard. That that transaction's nearing finalization. So do would they be able to buy Nintendo at this point? Absolutely not. not. There's no way that there's no way in hell that any regulatory authority would approve nope. that transaction, let alone the Japanese government. But uh, it was it was it's funny to watch Phil dream in those moments, uh, and and that was I think the major sub. The other things uh, was in relation to Game Pass, uh, and how much they are paying to get certain games onto the service. So you know, like an Assassin's Creed, they'd pay like a hundred million dollars to be able to get it on there. Theoretically, that's just their internal planning documents. Then they thought that if they wanted to get um, Jedi Survivor onto the service, it would cost them three hundred million dollars. And even Sarah Bond, who's like you know number two person basically after Phil, she's like, yeah, that's probably a bit too expensive. We'll pass on that one, yeah. you know. Because what was so, GTA um, Online was like fifteen million a month or something. A month, yeah. yeah. Red Dead was five million a month, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, to be fair though, like that's that I don't know. That sounds about right because yeah. those games, well, GTA in particular, is un- unspeakably massive. So that's crazy. Yeah, I got a twenty dollar sandwich the other day, and I was like, mm. this is the worst day of my week. <laughs> 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 um so yeah that was that was it but i think the interesting angles out of all of this uh obviously what um bethesda's working on sure but i think the fact that there's an all digital xbox and it's going to be the flagship Mm -hmm. xbox for the remainder of the generation that was kind of a bummer to be perfectly honest um it doesn't bode well for the future of physical ownership it doesn't bode well for game preservation um and yeah, I wondered what you guys thought about that because when I saw that, that really leaped out at me as being, you know, not great, not not the kind of future that I think yeah. the industry needs. The unfortunate truth is that if any of you listening right now, or any of you on this call, go to your local re- your local retailer, and I don't mean GameStop, go beyond, go to Best Buy, go to Target, go to Sam's Club, go to Walmart, look at their game section. It is getting smaller and smaller each and every passing quarter. And while they are spending money on putting in big ass posters with pre-order bonuses and all that stuff, there are less and less and less physical games out there to buy to the point where like I I I am a huge proponent and and as you all know of physical media, uh the market is shifting towards digital more and more and Alan as Wade much too. Mm-hmm. yeah like that's such a bummer man i'm really annoyed yeah, about that yeah. person but anyway we'll come back to that later <laughs> but i mean yeah. you know and and uh, you know maybe there's companies like strictly limited or limited run games that can step in to to kind yeah. of partner with companies to take those responsibilities that's why we're getting a lot of physical prints of stuff from konami like the castlevania collections and whatnot which is really rad but those are niches of niches uh at this point just considering looking at the market and so um I am not surprised that Microsoft is considering creating this Xbox Series X that is discless um, because the market is showing that. And I, and mm. you see, you see it with PlayStation. Yes. You're seeing it with Nintendo. Like the, the shelves are getting smaller and unless it's a special edition from your favorite franchise, people aren't going to the stores to buy games physically anymore. They're all doing yeah. it digitally day, not day, you know, not even day one, day Pre-load. zero. Buy, preloading and 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 midnight launches are no longer it's like not even midnight launch right 8 p.m now like it's it's four hours before midnight so people can enjoy it the night before so and as um, well like for yeah. microsoft if they don't if it's digital then they just cut out the middleman people use their yep. stores they don't have to give a cut to target or asda or whoever right totally yeah 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 it's a bummer uh, I don't like it at all, actually. Um, I really think it's important that it's protected. I mean, look, and there is ob- obviously the possibility for, like, you know, an external drive, for example. You make a little drive. Xbox can release a drive that plugs in via USB or whatever, and it can do the job. There's also the counter arguments, which is like, oh, well, discs are useless these days anyway because, you know, they're basically empty and you need to download the thing. But it's like, well... Not really. Like most yeah. games that ship with a disc actually do have stuff installed on them. Yes, there's also a day one patch, but there's also a playable game, you know? And I think that matters to a lot more people than people think, you know? Like, because not everyone has access to the internet in the same way or whatever, you know? Like people as well just like to own physical media. It's theirs and they own it for good. And I think that is something that is important to our industry that's worth protecting. 
Um, obviously, it's gone. Not gone in... Look, I think the end state is what you kind of see these days in the music business, which is if you want to go out and buy vinyl, you can. It's it's available. But it's going to be, as you've said, Gerard, like the limited run stuff where some third-party company agrees to step up and that's, you know, mm-hmm. that's it. Um, I think that really sucks. I really would like to see platforms commit to physical, but I just don't think... I agree with you. I don't think it's going to happen. I think from a commercial perspective they're not going to be interested in that future. They just want to have cut out the middleman, cut out the cost of production and just go straight digital. I love CDs, but you, good luck finding a new CD player and good luck finding new CDs from your favorite bands because now everything is digital with the USB flash drive mm-hmm. and or if you want to show your fandom, you buy the vinyl like you said, Ralph. Like there's, there's no longer a physical medium when it comes to music and the way that we think. Um, and I think games is the next evolution of that i think movies dvds and blu rays still have a ways to go um i think that i think that market is still pretty healthy considering that your console is a blu-ray player um yes. but I, I, I as time goes on and the market changes it's an unfortunate truth that it probably will all be digital and that sucks because you know we should be able to enjoy the physical thing that we have do you remember i mean we all dunked on microsoft for years ago for being like trading you can't just make games digital Hmm. and sony made that video of them trading the games and yeah here oh here we here we are what seven years later and that's like that's gonna happen unfortunately (laughs) totally totally no it's a bummer such bummer a bummer. podcast man damn yeah, okay. <laughs> all right uh, Sorry, though, ben, ben brodel cheer us up <laughs> yeah so um just before gerard and i hopped on jake you and ralph met with marvel snap what's what's his title on it creative director, uh, director? something like that creative lead or something mm-hmm. something like that yes you should probably yes. get that you should probably look yeah. that up but look <laughs> He's the one of the main dudes from Marvel Snap, okay? He's the co-founder of the studio and he's one of the senior leaders of the team. Uh, you know, he's 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 one of the boss people, that's for sure. Chief Development Officer. Okay. That's the one. There Chief Development Officer at Second Dinner. Um, Ralph, do you want to, you know, you, you're the big Marvel Snap guy. Do you want to tee up this um, interview? Yes, I was actually super excited for this. Like super excited because I love Marvel Snap. Uh, I don't, no one knows how much I play it, but I play a lot of it, <laughs> right? Yeah, we've staged and, uh, intervention. And, we have, yeah, that's right, that's right. So I actually, um, I just reached out to Ben. I'm like, dude, I want to talk to you about Marvel Snap. Let's go. And, he's, and he very graciously agreed. So we talked to him about his career because he started out at Blizzard. He was like project lead on Hearthstone. I uh, was a game director on Hearthstone for a time before st- setting up his own studio and um, had so many interesting stories, including one involving breaking his... <sighs> friend's legs or leg singular in a really great way which yeah. it's a that, great that's way a highlight that story and we'll tell we'll tell you about what that story is because these guys haven't heard it we'll tell them about it when we get back so yeah that's it the interview here it is all right well hello ben dude uh i am so excited to actually have you here because i mentioned this in passing from time to time but i'm massively addicted to your game fuck you i'm that addicted to your game like it's Dude, relaxed like, <laughs> like, you know i i it, honestly i it easily is the game i put the most number of hours into of any game this year uh wow. so yeah for sure but obviously that's to do with the convenience of being able to play it like you know yeah. wherever you yeah. are and whatever else uh but yeah i really really do love it a lot and so it's just awesome to like actually get to speak to you face to face so f- welcome to the podcast man thank you for being here thank you so much for inviting me i'm so excited to be here uh i can't wait to chat with you guys about all all kinds of stuff sure absolutely yeah well i mean actually we kind of want to start at the very beginning because the journey towards marvel snap kind of started quite a while for you back at blizzard when you were like a qa tester right is that how you how you got your start yes well uh yeah i i started actually in the pizza industry i was uh nice, I worked at a pizza, nice. <laughs> worked at a pizza is, that, is that in the delivery or in the creation aspect of the of the, uh, of the i was a sh- i was a ship supervisor i worked the front the front desk but a buddy of mine at the time we were working together at like a little cell phone games like nothing business we were just kind of like we never did anything but but he was one of the few people who did do something and then he went over to Blizzard and got a job at the night crew, uh, testing Warcraft three, the frozen throne. And, uh, I was like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. whoa." Yeah. Yeah. That's Mm. incredible. Uh, and I was like, dude, Blizzard is literally right here. Like we were just like blocks away from Blizzard for years and no idea. 
And so uh, uh, he, the night crew, dinner time was 10 o'clock, right? Because we were working 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. And so, like, there was you could only eat at Carl's Jr. in Irvine, where this where this place right. was. That was the only place that was open. So, uh, th- my buddy would call me, and I would deliver the last pizzas out of Gina's Pizza, where where, where where I'd been working, to Blizzard, and that's how I got to meet all the rest of the QA team there, and got my first job in the industry on the night crew quality shirts team uh, for uh, War Three: The Frozen Throne. That is so crazy, pizza man. Is there anything it can't do? Look at that. <laughs> like, the pasta is not my jam. Like, listen, that's I, right. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> definitely not. So, but you started in that gig and then you very quickly moved up to sort of like lead testing positions. Uh, and then after that, kind of the Hearthstone thing came about, right? So like, what's the the basic genesis of how that whole thing got going and how and your role in that at the very beginning? Yeah, so I went from from QA. I worked at QA on Diablo 2 110 patch, and and I was one of the lead environment uh, testers for World of Warcraft. And then I went into creative development, which was a new department at Blizzard at the time, uh, which is a whole bunch of stuff. But one of my big roles there was licensed product development. So uh, you know, we had the World of Warcraft uh, role playing game, we had the uh, World of Warcraft trading card game, uh, we had StarCraft board game, you know, a bunch of games, physical goods. We had shirts. We were responsible for all kinds of tchotchkes and stuff. Um, but that was where I went after uh, QA. And because I'd been working on the World of Warcraft trading card game for years, uh, when it was time to think about what was next for, for Blizzard and what, what to do with this team they wanted to build to take advantage of big opportunities, right? Like I think, you know, Blizzard was missed the gate on MOBAs, which is a pretty, sure. was pretty, pretty, like, pretty tough yeah. pill to swallow for Blizzard, given that, you know, MOBAs was birthed within Warcraft 3. So they wanted they wanted to have like a team that was more nimble, right? They could be like, oh, there's a thing. Let's chase it down. And that thing was what we called at, at Blizzard Team 5, which was the supposed to be a nimble team that chased opportunities. And the first one was, can we make the World of Warcraft trading card game into an online experience? And that team mm-hmm. became the Hearthstone team. Yeah, right. So were you leading that team from the start or? I no. No, you weren't. No. Okay. So I, I was... <laughs> Yeah, personally, it was it was a, a a pretty funny journey of 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 understanding my strengths and weaknesses. So I I uh, uh, there was a guy who joined that team right at the beginning. He uh, I said, hey, look, I'm the guy in the studio who knows the most about the World of Warcraft credit card game, right? I've been working on this since its inception. I've been working with a company making that game. Like I'm the person you want on this project. He said, great, you'll be the game director on that project. And I was like, damn, nice. <laughs> and then uh, and then he said, ah, you know, hey, listen, I hadn't talked to. The rest of the people here yet i didn't really understand what game director at blizzard meant you're not gonna be game director i was like damn (laughs) but i get it i get it and then uh at the time i was a senior producer in creative development and so he's like okay but you'll be a senior game designer on this project i was like that's that's what i get it and then uh uh, then rob part of the creative uh chief creative officer at blizzard came into my office and said hey listen i know i know they said you're going to be senior games on this project we're actually going to offer you associate game designer and I was like, oh, no, I was going to be the director like three weeks ago. Like, what happened? And, uh, and I, was, I was pretty upset, honestly. I was like, listen, I just worked my uh, way right. up from associate producer to producer to senior producer. And now I'm going back to associate game designer. Like, this is bull. Sure. And I, so I joined the team as an associate game designer. And within one week of working with Eric Dodds, who was the lead designer at the time, he eventually became game director on, that, on the project on, on Hearthstone. Within one week, I was like, oh, I am absolutely an associate game designer. <laughs> like, I don't know right. anything about game design. I don't know what I'm doing here. Like this guy's so clearly way better than me. Right. Like, they made the right they made the right decision. Interesting. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, right. So then but eventually though you would sort of step up to become the leader of that team. Yes. I did eventually and- become game director on Hearthstone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what was that like to be in that position in that moment? Because obviously Hearthstone really had a moment. Like it was, it just went out there and went out the gates and was gigantic and everyone was playing Hearthstone and like, because there were collectible card, like digital collectible card games before that, but nothing like Hearthstone in terms of the scale of it. So what was it like being the director of that game in that moment? Well, it, I mean, it was really fun. Uh, you know, it's... You not not everyone gets to be like the face of a massive, you know, cultural movement in some ways, right? Like I got to, you know, uh, like be the be the front person of this thing that like yeah. millions of people loved. Uh, and actually, it was like you know a little a little terrifying to to jump out of that position and into something that you know 
you know, it, when you hit a really high point in your career, you know, you always wonder, is this, is this the highest point I will, I will ever worry. Get, you know? like, We all, we, as content creators, <laughs> we think that every single fucking minute of every single day. So don't worry, man. Yeah. On that. Yeah. <laughs> So how does that come about, though, specifically being the face? Is it is it because of the type of game it is? Because, like, obviously, there's a whole team behind you, but oh, yeah. you could have been you could have almost been elusive. You could have just been yeah. the secret elusive elusive leader. So, like, who makes the choice to, like, throw you out there and get you talking? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, like, one of the weird things about being the face of a project is that uh, you get way too much credit, right? Like, I, I was one person. I wasn't even one of the leaders on Hearthstone when it started, right? I was like, you know. An important, I was an important part of the team. Right? I made a lot of like really critical decisions that really helped Hearthstone become a success. But I was like, a, you know, a percentage of the team, like a small percentage of this really, really talented team who had a huge impact on all of us had a huge impact on what Hearthstone became. Right. So uh, like, wh- like that process of me becoming the face was just like, I would do interviews or right? I would, I would like do stuff where I, you know, some, some press or something like this. Somebody would reach out and say, Hey, I want to talk to, we want to talk to somebody from Blizzard about Hearthstone and I would get in there and then I would keep getting, they would keep requesting me. Right. Because, because I give, would give them better content. You good, you're good right? chat. You're good chat. Yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> you just pitched us on how to not have heart attacks before we started recording. Yeah, or something. yeah, yeah that was a whole other thing. <laughs> What's the book, by the way? What's the book everyone has to read? Why we sleep. You, Why we sleep. You, if you're listening to this, you must download this book. It's, it's, I will, it, I will save your life. And then you can reach out to me on threads and be like, hey, listen, I read Why We Sleep because of you and your, and now I'll, I'll live until a ripe old age. Thank you so much, Ben Bro. That's nice. like, uh, this book is changing my life. Yeah, it's, it's uh, wild. That and Pokemon <laughs> Sleep. Pokemon Sleep is an incredible game that really we incentivizes me to go to bed on time. <laughs> we spoke for a good 20 minutes before we started recording about sleep, by the way. And to be perfectly honest, it was a very useful conversation. It was a good pitch. <laughs> I, took a, I took a lot away. I took a lot away from that conversation. He logged on like, nice to meet you. Are you guys sleeping enough? <laughs> Yeah, that's seriously how it was. I can't hurt you guys, you know? <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the moment when, uh, obviously, you're at um, Hearthstone and uh, at Blizzard, sorry, and leading up Hearthstone, but then you make the decision you want to, you know, go do your own thing. So what was the impetus for all that? You, what, what led you to be like, okay, time to strike out on my own? You know, I, I was really lo- loving my time on Hearthstone, right? Like being part of a community in that way was like really emotionally satisfying for me, right? Like uh, my role, one of my big role models in the games industry is uh, Mark Rosewater. He leads uh, Magic the Gathering uh, development, and he's been doing that for decades, right? So I kind of imagined myself doing a similar thing on Hearthstone, right? Just like being mr hearthstone for yeah. you know decades right i've done it for you know i was on the hearthstone team for literally 10 years uh, at blizzard and uh because we did it we worked on it six years before launch and then we uh, worked, worked on it for four years after launch and so i that was kind of like the, the path i was on and and uh uh my business partner the guy who was my my boss at blizzard and the guy who i started second dinner with hamilton chu uh what like once we kind of like had this idea in our heads like it's all I could think about because like Hamilton is one of those special people. Like uh, everybody who's ever worked with Hamilton wants to work with Hamilton again. He's like, uh, like this. I don't. I don't know. I don't even. I don't. I don't even know like how to explain why he's just like an incredibly wise person who you know will be successful whatever it is that he's going to do. And so mm-hmm. when I was like, oh man, like do I? If I was ever going to do this, doing with Hamilton is like the best imaginable situation. And like, I'm getting to the point where I'm working like more on managing upwards and like, you know, trying to like do team management, I have a lot of reports and less like in, in the shit, you know, like, like actually building something with my hands, which was an incredibly satisfying part of my time on Hearthstone. And I was one of two game designers on Hearthstone, you know, for, for years, you know, without very, like many other people on the team. And so I got to like get in, I did a lot of programming. I did a lot of like, you know, prototyping. I love that stuff. It was so fun to like have those moments of eureka over and over again and you don't get a moment of eureka when you're like you know when you're managing no. people right it's a different it's a different Making thing PowerPoints. It's, yeah, right. it's still satisfying yeah. but not it, like for me it didn't hit the same like you know like moments and so like sure. the thought of like hey maybe i could get back into that you know maybe i could have those moments again and and build stuff you know from scratch you know with awesome people you know from the from the beginning that was just like this, this once, once I got it in my head, 
I started rebuilding my vision for myself of like, hey, maybe I'm not just going to be on Hearthstone for decades. Maybe I maybe I could do something else. Yeah, right. So did you have the idea for Snap first? Like, was that the thing? Like when you said we've got this idea in our head, was the idea this like three lane short round kind of card game? Or was it like, no, we want to make a, a Marvel game. That's the thing we really need to do. We need to work with Marvel. Let's go get them. Like, what was that? So, yeah, we definitely had literally zero game ideas leaving Blizzard right. because... I, because I, I just didn't want to like, like if you work for a company, like they own the stuff that you make, right? Like that's the agreement I signed with Blizzard, right? They're paying me to make, to do work for them. Right. So like if I'm like on the clock, you know, doing work for me, it's inappropriate. So I, I just, I didn't want any stink of that. So I actually was sending game ideas to Blizzard leadership, like the the week I was leaving because I was like, listen, I had this idea and you own it. So like, I, <laughs> I'm going to take it with me. I just, so you know, like, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, all right. <laughs> We didn't. I, uh, I, I've heard about stuff like that in game contracts, by the way, where they're like, if you come up with an idea while you're working for us, even if you spin it out on your own, we own it. Like I've heard I mean, that sort of stuff. That exists, that's, right? That's, that's literally how employment works, right? Like okay. I, I, you're, yeah. they're employing me as a game designer to come up with game idea related stuff. That's like the whole. It's like why they're giving me money, right? Like I yeah, get but, it. my, it's, but I've heard that like even if you come up with an idea and then pursue it externally in your own on your own time on your own dime, that like a, a publisher, whatever, may swoop in there based on some contract yes, thing and be like, because that sounds- because if you have a great idea and yeah. you're incentivized to not give it to the company paying you for your great ideas, that's like yeah. real bad, right? Like, what's yeah. the why, why would I ever? Why would you employ me? If I'm just going to take all the good ideas for myself, right? Like, it's just uh, the incentives are all messed up. So I get it. I get it. But like, uh, and I wanted to just make clear to everybody that like, look, I'm, you know, while I'm employed at Blizzard, like I'm a Blizzard boy, 100%. Like my, I'm advocating for Blizzard's best interests. I'm giving my full self to my job. And then once I left, that's when we had our first conversation about, okay, what should we do? You know, right. me and Hamilton sitting in the room I'm literally standing in right now. This was Second Hitter's first office. It's the building. It's like the, the room above my garage. Uh, and uh, we, we sat here. We we're like, all right, hopefully we have some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so then the game, and I guess there's a lot of people who are watching this, this, uh, this episode now who haven't played Marvel Snap. So maybe could you just give us like the quick 30 second oh, yeah. primer on what it is just to give people some grounding? Certainly. So Marvel Snap is the fastest card battler in the multiverse. It's like, uh, it's super, super quick. I mean, you know, games average less than three minutes. It, you know, the Mar- it's in the Marvel Universe, right? So it's like uh, all your, you know, it's Spider-Man and Wolverine and Captain America and Scarlet Witch and Black Widow and the Hulk and, you know, all these awesome characters. Uh, it's like a really, uh, it's a game you can play 100% free to play. It's like really, you know, easy to learn cards super fast. Uh, there's no um like booster packs right you just like upgrade your cards and you get new cards constantly through like a pretty rewarding system um it's it you know something that we're really proud of we we worked worked, like a lot of years most mobile games take way less time making games than we took on marvel snap and we took a long time making sure the game looks incredible all the cards are like fully modeled in 3d which is ridiculous like i mean There's just Very like nice. the amount of money we spend making this game look <laughs> insane is, is like a little crazy. But uh, we wanted to make like the best looking card game ever made. And uh, and it's like, like it's, um, you know, I, I think about like the, like the, uh, how, like we, I think we did something cool. We made a game that plays that fast, but is still incredibly strategically deep, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's just, it, there's like this really great, like value for your time, <laughs> you know, like if you're going to only do it for three minutes, you want to like get all the juice of an incredibly deep and super fun collectible card game. And I, and we did that. Was Marvel snap always Marvel snap? Like were there weirder ideas? Was it going to be longer? Was it going to be like a fighting game at one point? No. Uh, so I, I will tell you, we started, um, you know, one of the first things was this relationship with Marvel because the guy who, who runs Marvel games used to work with me and Hamilton at Blizzard. And uh, he wanted to turn the Marvel Games brand into something that rivals Marvel Studios or Blizzard, right? Like, these are incredible brands that everyone's like, oh, is there a new Marvel movie? I got to see it. Of course, it's going to be awesome. They're all awesome. Is there a new Blizzard game? I got to try it, right? Blizzard games are awesome, right? And Marvel Games wasn't there yet. And then Jay Ong took over and he started doing games like Spider-Man, right? That was the first Mm -hmm. deal that he did, you know, when when he joined Marvel Games. And the quality of Marvel games is like gone way up, you know? 
And it's because of this strategy they have of let's partner with awesome people to make incredible Marvel games that really elevate the, the Marvel brand. And they've done it. Like the, the Marvel games recently have been just like like Guardians of the Galaxy and like this is this is a Guardians of the Galaxy podcast. Where, where big time. Guys. We are like big time. We are literally yeah. I think probably this game. the most vocal fans of that fucking game. We love it's, it so much. They've so. been there and this is this is a lot of the vision of of uh Jay Ong and the new crew that the credible crew that, that he's hired over at, at um at Marvel Games. And they they reached out to us and said, Hey, look, we like you know, Jay knew he'd been working with us. He's like, I need somebody who can make like something on mobile that's going to really like help me achieve my goals let's make something great on mobile right let's win let's make something a mobile game that wins awards right Mm -hmm. and so that was like uh you know part of the like initial like sauce that helped us kind of think about what to do and we actually had been working on something like a little different i tried to skin it as like a marvel game and we were like, no, 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 this is just not, this isn't it. we got to build something from the ground up to be a great Marvel game, to celebrate like the fantasy of Marvel, you know, heroes and villains facing off. Uh, and that's like, that was the, that was like the genesis of this thing. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, Hamilton uh, said, you know, I've always wanted to play a strategy game with the backgammon doubling cube, which is like, lets you like double the stakes of the game uh, during the game. And those, it was like those two things, right? Like, like Marvel, like what is awesome about Marvel, the heroes themselves and this backgammon and doubling cube idea. We actually, the first thing we did was we started playing Hearthstone and Hamilton would sit behind me and would say, Hey, if your opponent doubled the stakes of the game, if they, instead of playing for one star, you were playing for two stars, would you retreat right now mm-hmm. if they were trying to double you? And I'd be like, Ooh, I don't think I would. And he's like, okay, would you double your opponent right now? It's like, oh, maybe I would, you know? And we learned that that mechanic is so strategically deep. It's all the depth of Hearthstone plus all the depth of bluffing your opponent out of the game. And we were like, look, this, is, this, is a, this has so much strategic depth. We can just build the simplest card game that just has one card deck, the Heroes and Villains of Marvel, and rely on all the incredible fun and depth of this bluffing mechanic to take us all the way to a game that's, that feels incredibly strategically deep. And that, that was it. That was the start. That was the, the theory. And then we actually really quickly got into a place where we had figured out some of the core rules of Marvel Snap. That's so interesting that the Snap mechanic, you would say, is the pillar of its strategicness. Because for me personally, what I look at is uh, the three lane structure and yep. the way those lanes are randomly generated. Yeah. Uh, was, and I guess, look, okay, let me actually frame this as a question. To what degree is Snap yep a response to some of the criticisms of Hearthstone, which, you know, and if anyone's not familiar with Hearthstone, fantastic game, obviously, but it's quite long and it has some very established kind of deck types that need to be played in very specific ways. And and there's not a lot of variation in how you might play those from game to game. And the card acquisition process is very much just about buying packs, whatever. As I look at Snap, it looks like a response. Am I misreading it? Is that how you guys designed it or not? Uh, there's definitely some of that DNA. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you a tale. And I, I, you know, I, earlier I mentioned it's the best card game to play while pooping. And I was, that's not like, uh, that's, that's, there's a little bit put of that, that on the, this, put that on all the posters, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, there there the centerpiece of the we marketing do campaign it. everywhere you go. We all do it, man. Let's just be honest about it. You know, let's just say it finally. <laughs> so, uh, a buddy of mine, I was at a party and he rolls up and he's on crutches. And I was like, dude, what happened? And he's like, oh, I broke my leg. It's actually your fault. I was like, what? <laughs> oh, I didn't even know you broke your leg. He's like, all right, well, I'll tell you the story. So uh, he he works he worked at Riot at the time that this happened, and he used to play Hearthstone on the toilet at at Riot. And he, uh, you know, Hearthstone on average actually was I think one of the fastest card games when it came out. It's it's a, you know on average quite fast, about seven minute games on average. And uh, but uh, he queued up as a control warrior into a control warrior, and that's like an enormously long game. It took him about forty minutes to play this game, right? And so he, he was on the toilet 40 minutes. When the game's over, he stands up and his both oh, his legs are falling asleep going. and he collapses in the bathroom at Riot and breaks his leg. So he's like, like writhing around on the floor of the bathroom. It's kind of badass. <laughs> Top gamer move. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, I guess that is a little bit, a little bit oh. my fault. Uh, nothing to say. And, at, you know, at the time, after Hearthstone came out, a game called Clash Royale came out, which yes. had four and a half minute games. Yeah, and I was like really jealous. I was like, "Damn, I you know, if I'm looking at the clock, this meeting starts in five minutes. I can play a game of Clash Royale right yeah, now yeah, for yeah, sure." Yeah. And I was like, "Damn, I wish, I wish I could like like get that with a collectible card game." 
I want like a collectible card game within five minutes. Like hundred percent could play. If I have five minutes, I guarantee I could finish this game. And so that is that that, that was part of it. That was part of the influx. That's so interesting because the previous mobile game that I played, probably the first mobile game that I played properly was Clash Royale. And I played that game for years at like, you know, whatever level. And um, yeah, I mean, like, I eventually had to quit that game because it made me so mad. And I was just like, I can't, I can't. It's just, it, it just was awakening all those like League of Legends memories where I was like, I'm a terrible person when I play this game. I need to stop <laughs> playing this game. Much as I love it, it was just like, this is bad. Oh, yeah. And that yeah, is what I, I mean, actually made the snap, the, the, the jump to snap, to be honest. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. 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 Because uh, that, you know, the that other, pace really mattered. Sorry, go on. You go. The other big influence for Marvel Snap was um, some, like I played, I played a lot of board games. When I was growing up, my dad had thousands of board games in an era where you had to like import board games from Germany because it was, you know, they weren't selling board games at Target back then, right? And uh, uh, we used to have mandatory family game nights where I wasn't allowed to go out on, on certain nights of the week because we had to, we were forced to play games with our family. We were the family that for like, if it was your birthday, we did a magic seal deck tournament. You know what I mean? Like it was like all of my mom played, my dad played, my brothers played, we were always gaming. Wow. So I have like, like a lot of my inspiration comes from board games. And one of the mechanics I've always loved is simultaneous reveal mechanics. There's a game called Lord of the Rings, The Confrontation by Reiner Kinesia, one of the, the most prolific game designer ever to live. And there's a game called The Game of Thrones board game by Christian Peterson, who is uh, uh, a friend of mine who worked on, uh, worked on a bunch of Warcraft and, and Starcraft board games together while I was at Blizzard. He, he made a, a Game of Thrones board game, which has a simultaneous reveal mechanic. And I've, I've always loved this mechanic because it's, it's like got so many interesting mind games to it, right? Like you're, What's he going to do? Oh, he's got these options. I think if he does this, then I should do this. But if he knows that I'm going to do that, then he should do this. But if he knows that I know that he knows that, I'm going to do this. And it's like, there's this, it's just like, it's so much fun. And I, I've always wondered, like, is there, is there a thing there with collectible card games? Is this a mechanic we could bring to collectible card games? And uh, so, you know, it was one of those things that I was like hoping to find some juice with. And uh, it was hard, actually, because in, in these games, what makes that mechanic interesting is context. Right. Like I, if I if I have no if you could do anything, then there's it's not actually that interesting. Right. Because I don't know why you would do this versus this other thing. Right. It's kind of like a tic -tac, uh, uh, rock, paper, scissors. Right. If we play rock, paper, scissors right now, it's not that interesting. I don't know, like if you're more likely to throw rock or paper or scissors. Right. But I used to play professional rock, paper, scissors. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, at are, are you being serious right now? Is that one hundred percent serious? <laughs> and in, in, <laughs> at professional level, rock paper scissors, they give you a minute of taunting before you throw, <laughs> and it changes everything. <laughs> because I could start, I could do my taunting like, "Bro, I'm rock, I'm all I'm rock all day." You think I won't throw rock? I'm throwing rock, <laughs> you know. And then your opponent's like, "Oh my god, is he is he throwing rock, or is he trying to get in my head?" And he's trying to get me to throw paper, which means he's going to throw scissors which means I should throw, right? But then maybe he knows that and I should, you know, like it's, and, and it, it's, it creates this really interesting mind game. Just, you just need some context. And that was the genesis of the three locations, right? If you have three different places that have different rules on them, that maybe like this mm -hmm. one gives cards here plus power. Well, maybe then I should obviously put my cards there, but I don't want to overcommit there. What if they are going to like totally let me have that one? I keep playing cards there and I'm like, ah, they get, you know, like it's context. And that's what makes simultaneous reveals work for the game. So th these are those are the you're asking about all the. <laughs> there's a lot oh. of different innovations. They all kind of link together in different ways. I mean, my question now is, why the fuck have I not seen this professional rock paper scissors scissors stream somewhere? Like that sounds like something that should be that on Twitch like content, and it would baby. absolutely yeah. pop off. Like that is <laughs> uh, it was great. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I don't think it happens anymore. But it, but all these tournaments were taking place annually under a freeway overpass in in Los Angeles, and people came in costumes. So one guy came as Sergeant Scissors. Uh, I came as the Lumberjack. Uh, there was a uh, uh, the burglar. Who, like it was just a, it was like a, a eclectic crew, but there was like refs with whistles, right? And like, like, like clearly defined rings and they would hold both players' hands and they would blow the whistle like, oh, and then you're, one, two, three, shoot. You know, it was like, it was intense. That sounds incredible. I really hope this brings this, hopefully this comes back after this podcast. Now that people know this existed, that someone does the job and brings it back. Yeah, I'm interested. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I want to sort of like get into a little bit more like in the detail for uh, the snap now. Uh, so apologies for anyone who's not playing snap, uh, but we'll try and keep it relatively high level. So it's like, you know, still accessible. Oh, but it's it also, it's free. So like, there's no excuse not to like oh, yeah, sure. go get it right now. Yeah. While yeah, you're listening. Absolutely. <laughs> sure. um, I, my question was, uh, first question is like, 
What's it like to try to disrupt the meta while simultaneously trying to stabilize it? Because I look at that task and I'm just thinking like, God, that task would suck. I would re- I'm really glad I don't have to do that job, you know, because it seems <laughs> really, really hard. So what is I it mean, like to be in a position where you're trying to like change things up all the time, but make sure stuff doesn't change too much and it all just falls to shit? I mean, I don't have to do that job either. We have incredibly talented people who are doing that job at Second Dinner who are, who are doing a much better job at, than I would do. But I, I would say that like the, the goal, like in some ways, like changing a card, making a card do something different is new content, right? It's like a new puzzle to solve, right? Like that's part of what's fun about collectible card games is like, you know, ooh, what's, what, what's good right now? What should I do? Or I have all these options. Like how can I put together something that people aren't expecting? Or, or is, you know, I keep playing a game, I keep running into these cards. What would be good against those cards? Maybe this card, right? And that's like a really fun challenge. And, uh, you know, if we're just playing the same decks against each other over and over and over, even if you don't like building decks, you like you you just use you're just trying to use the best deck if that's the same best deck all the time every day eventually you're like ah you know i've seen this right the locations help a lot at making every game feel very different but if we're also using different decks against each other that's a big source of new experience which means our problem solving uh skill comes into play right i've never been here before how do i solve this problem how do i play against this deck right and it's it's more interesting if there's just more variety and so our goal is, isn't necessarily to come up with some like, you know, perfect moment in time where everything is equivalently balanced, but it actually does create like, you know, bumps in the road that we then get to, you know, see people trying new things and experimenting with things in, in ways they haven't before. And, um, uh, you know, that's, I think that's great. That's like, that's, that's good for everybody. Hmm. So what's it like internally when you release a card that is clearly like messing shit up, right? So for example, there's a card that was released recently called Aliath. Am I pronouncing that correctly, by the way? Aliath? You know, I, I, I think it's Aliath. But, Aliath, uh, okay, cool. Uh, we had a problem recently where we asked, we asked Marvel how to pronounce uh, Dokken. And they were like, it's pronounced bacon. And I was like, really? That's quite strange. Okay, I mean, you say so. And then we released a video where like, it's bacon. And the community is like, what the fuck? That's like absolutely not how you should pronounce that name. And I was, and I was like, I'm upset. And then Marvel came back to like, no, no, it's Doc. And I'm like, yeah. Like, what do I do? Oh, so, you know. I, so, so, so a lot of came along. Kind of yeah. There's no pronunciation guide in some of these right. things. Right. It's like know? it's like cat Sith all over again. It's the same thing. <laughs> um, so for anyone's not playing Snap, Aliath came along. It's a very powerful card that really like totally upended a lot of the game. And yep. it created a new, an entirely new meta where and and I and I mean I don't want to miss it's just my personal take. It wasn't a super fun meta, to be perfectly yep. honest. I understand. It was a I bit of a problem, it, right? Yep. Yeah. So I, my question is, what's happening internally when a card like that drops and you're seeing what's happening? Are you guys like in panic mode, like in crisis meetings? Like, what do you fucking do about this card? Or are you kind of just like sitting back being like, a card, man. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Yep, it is. So looking at the data, are you, like, are you calm and collected in those moments? Are you just sort of like taking it one step at a time? Or are you kind of like frantically figuring out what to do next? Well, you know, I, it, it, one of the things that we try and do in and when we're designing a, a, a set of cards, right, is we're trying to give you uh, options if you are running into the same thing over and over again, right? If you keep seeing Elias over and over and over again, how do you how do you make sure that you're immune to, to whatever they're going to do, right? Can you tune your stuff so that you're better, like you, when you see Elias, you're like, yeah, you know, like you weren't expecting this, but actually, you know, I got the answer, you know? And if we put the answers in the card pool, then you as the player can solve your own problems, sure. right? You're like, I hate seeing a life, but so, so screw it. I'm putting in Cosmo right. or, yeah. or, you know, whatever, whatever super, whatever you think is like the exact right answer uh, to like the Nimrod or whatever, right? Like you can, you can, you can tune against it if we've given you the tools to do so. So that's like, you know, that, that's part of our goal is to design cards that, that are effective answers to things that we could, to questions that we could <laughs> put into the game. Uh, but also it's like, you know, 
it, you know, there's a certain amount of like, we don't, we don't need to be like, okay, shut, shut it all down, shut it all down right now. You know, <laughs> like, you know, if every single game where the Lyoth is played, like the, the, the opponent stops playing Marvel Snap forever. Right. Like we're not in that, <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like that. Right. But it's like, so, you know, we want to, we don't want something that's like, you know, a super unfun experience to go on for, for too long. Right. So yeah, we, I mean, that's part of what we do. We, we've already, as you know, we've already made a uh, change to, uh, at least the decks where Alliance is, is like, you know, especially uh, doing his thing. Yeah, right. And so that and that is an interesting decision in itself because you didn't actually change Alioth in that instance, which was the card that was introduced that created this new problem. Yeah. Change the cards around him. So, like for example, Galactus was this card that yep. again, not to get into the detail, but he basically smashes two thirds of the map if he's winning a lane, and then it just completely upends the game. Typical and Galactus. He, Typical exactly right. Eater of right. worlds. <laughs> so, so again, yeah. like that decision. Then why did in that in that specific instance? Why did you make that decision to like hit Galactus rather than hitting Eliath? And is that like what does that say about your your broader approach to how you tackle these problems? Well, I, it's it's all every card is connected to every other card, right? It's a web, right? Nobody plays a one card deck, right? So. Uh, if you change a card, it affects every deck that it's currently a part of and every deck it could be a part of, right? So uh, when we're looking at, you know, uh, this deck is overperforming, we're, we're, we're thinking about like, okay, what's good against that deck, right? Like if we nerf this deck, those decks will get worse because like they're one of their best matchups goes away, right? And, and what's left is like bad matchups for them, right? It, what's, what's like, what decks are, is this deck keeping in check, right? Is, are there some decks where this is the only bad matchup, right? Then changing, making this deck worse is just going to make those decks unstoppable, right? So there's there's a lot of um, it's like it's like a finely balanced you know uh, structure where you take one piece out, everything collapses, right? So it is it's always risky to change something, but obviously if the thing is collapsing already, it's like less it's less risky to pull no. another thing off of it, right? Maybe that maybe no. that would create balance. Uh, yeah. But uh, for these things, I mean, we actually you know one thing I, I'm really stoked about that the team is doing really well is that when we change anything in the game we write up like a like almost like an essay about like why this right why we had a lot of options we could have changed numbers up or down or card text or this card or that card like why did we change this one specifically right what is you know like what is the impact that this would have over these other changes and so that's yeah that's just like a thing that i think it's funny because it both levels up all of our players as game designers and as card game Mm -hmm you know, fans, but also like give some insight into, into, you know, in some places, in some places it's arbitrary, right? We got to choose something and like, I don't know, mm. you know sure. has been doing this thing for a while, you know, mix it up. <laughs> it has, it has. So then what's the testing process for, for all this as well? Cause you've mentioned there's this, obviously like this design document essay thing, but how many people are play testing these changes at second dinner before they go live? And what is the actual process that supports that? We do we do a lot of playtesting. Uh, the whole team gets involved in, in playtesting, so we have like playtests um, every week, multiple ones where like different people jump in and try out the new stuff and try out changes and um, and talk about them and send feedback. It's just like uh, been part of our culture since day one, essentially, of, of the studio. It's just we're like always jumping in together and having fun playtesting. Yeah, right. Um, oh, sorry, Jake, you go. Was there was there a card that you guys? thoroughly tested and ever put out in the world that completely surprised you? Is there like a notorious card? Uh, I mean, this happens all the time. Like okay. we our our goal isn't to like define the experience that players will have. Our goal is to create tools that players like there's just, there's just like, a, like, you know, a double digit number of people working at second dinner and there's, way more people play Marvel <laughs> Snap in the world, right? So like, we are just not going to be able to figure out every combination of stuff, right? Players are smarter, you know, just, just the pure number of neurons, you know, working this problem, you know, <laughs> uh, out, you know out, of, out of second thing is way higher, right? So constantly we'll, and, 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 you know, there's a way to like say, okay, you know, this card gives this card plus two. You're like, okay, we know that those then work together and it's a combo, right? But like, no player feels smart about putting those cards together in a deck. Right, because we figured it out. We made these cards work well together, right? But if we say, "Hey, look, you know, this card gives the next card you play plus three power," and this card says, "Hey, when you play this, it splits into three copies," you're like, "Oh, what if I give it plus three power and then it splits into three copies?" Now that buff gets ha- happens three times. We didn't design those things to work together. We just designed some cards that did some weird stuff, 
And it just so happens that they're great to go together. And players mm-hmm. get to discover those things, and then they get to feel smart, right? Our job as designers isn't to feel smart. It's to create opportunities for players to discover things that we didn't even know could happen. We just create, we just explore the space and create all these different options, and then players discover how to use those things together. It's like when people started making robots with penises in Zelda. <laughs> you got to give people the tools to succeed. Exactly, exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly the same thing. That's right. <laughs> I mean, you've just released a PC client for uh, Marvel Snap. Very impressive client, by the way, because obviously I played on mobile, you know, like almost all the time. But if you boot it up on PC, it looks really nice and it really pops off. So you guys did a really fantastic job on that. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I really do feel like it's a, it's like a, a step change. You know, it, it, it it's weird. It looks like it always has always has been on PC when you look yeah. up on PC. It's just like, oh yeah, this looks, this looks great. Because often when you play the mobile, like play a mobile game on PC, it looks like you're playing a mobile game on a PC, but this yeah. is built from the ground up to be like a PC trading card game that, yeah, the visual presentation on it is really top tier. So yeah, really like really like playing on a PC actually. But what, um, what can you give us a look at maybe what's next in terms of like big new rollout features or stuff that you got coming? Because obviously there's new seasons every month, sure. But yep. uh, and you and you added the 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 ranking queue. Before that, you added a conquest mode, which is yeah. like a different game mode to play. Is there anything else that's that we can look forward to in the next little while? Stuff to keep an eye out for. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we really like doing is publishing our roadmap. So you can actually go online and see the Marvel Snap, like, here's what's coming soon. Here's what's coming in the medium term. Here's what we got, like, you know, on, here's what we're ideating on, right? Here's, like, some options that we're thinking through. So if like, anybody who's curious gets to go check that out and then give us feedback on whether they think we're idiots, you know, like, uh, hey, why are you working on this? This is, like, <laughs> I want this. <laughs> so there's some, there's some juicy stuff on there. We were, you know, we're thinking about new game modes. We're thinking about, you know, social features. And there's a bunch of other, like, great quality of life features that are, that are coming up that we've been continually adding every, every patch. And there's some, you know, check it out. Check it out. Give us feedback. Yeah, cool. Nice. And uh, in terms of for second dinner, do you see the studio staying as a one game studio? Like, is is it like this case is busy enough as it is? Or is it like, no, nah, we're pretty hungry for some more stuff and you'll be working on a second game, maybe? Yeah, I mean, look, Marvel Snap is like, is like basically this, this thing that like the whole studio is like, you know, all in on, right? It's our, it's our, yeah. it's our, it's our bread and butter, right? It's like what we're you know, we've staffed up massively since we launched it and people are just like all trying to make awesome content and awesome new features for this game that we care so deeply about. But we're like, you know, we're always working on other stuff. I got a couple other things cooking. It's just like, if they're not, they're not even close to the scale of, of like, you know, our big flagship. So. Yeah. Right. And I mean, and for you personally, cause you've been working on card games now since 2008. So is that when you started yes. Hearthstone? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, well, I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for you personally, do you ever see yourself working on a non-card game? Do you have that itch where like, hey, one day I'm going to make something else? Like, is that is that it? Is that a thing or not? I don't know, man. I'm such a card game nerd, you know? Like, this is just, I, I've, I've always been into collectible card games. Uh, I love the, the genre. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, card games, what's interesting about card games uh actually transcends some genres right like the things that i love about collectible card games certainly would there are things that i and i like i tend to like a lot of genres there are certainly some genres i feel like i could make an impact on someday mm-hmm. there's like man i wish someone would make a like a more accessible more uh like like high variance version of civilization i think that'd be dope uh but i don't know that i'm the right person to make that game i i uh i have i have like thoughts about a lot of genres uh that mm-hmm. i think uh if somebody else does it in the next you know 20 years maybe someday i'll be like all right it's time to fix battle royales or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is please <laughs> please fix Stop battle royales please bad news, bad news. i do think you know so it's interesting battle royales are um are roguelikes i think battle royales yeah, I, are i you, agree you, with that completely you start from zero you start yeah. with nice like naked with with you know fists or whatever and then you like run around and get more powerful right eventually you're like wearing a like level three armor and level three helmet. you got like a bazooka or whatever. And that's, and then you die, you lose everything, right? That's the roguelike experience. That's like what, how we define roguelikes. Uh, I would love Battle Royale to match even closer to the roguelike formula. I wish that instead of kill, when you, when you kill a person in PUBG, you get all their stuff. That's a narrowing function on variants, right? Then we end up, like I always end up with a level three helmet and level three vest and the in the, the exact rifle i want with the exact scope i'm looking you know what i mean it's like the same every time and i wish uh battle royales and roguelikes got even more married i guess uh mm. that's like 
the the touch I wish to see. Well, we're stealing this idea, so thank you. Uh, Ralph and I are founding our new studio. You're, 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 this is <laughs> the problem. You know. there's, there's, yeah, there you go. Somebody, somebody who currently has a successful battle royale could just make this flip, and then they're, you're like, oh, damn it. You know, uh, I guarantee a... you Tim Sweeney's listening to this right now, taking yeah. notes, man. You're going to see it in Fortnite roll down in two fucking weeks. Give it up. Yeah. All you need to get it done. You know? Yeah. You know, yeah, um, I'm the guy. I'm the guy to really make Fortnite successful. That's what they need is the yeah. Yahoo right. makes card games. <laughs> <laughs> um well ben uh really again can't thank you enough for joining us it's uh always fantastic like seeing you and the energy that you bring and the way, the way you talk about the stuff you're working on is fantastic being able to chat to you face to face about this thing that you've made is really amazing uh as i said i personally really 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 love it, it and i don't see myself stopping with it anytime soon i think you really you and the team have made something really special so congratulations Thanks. and I uh I appreciate it. I will say, listen, I, I mentioned this maybe, maybe it was in the pre-call. I, I get like way too much credit for the work that I do on Hearthstone and on Marvel Snap. I'm literally one person on a team of like, this dude is 80 people, right? And my impact is closer to 180th than to like 81th. <laughs> you know, no. you know, like no. <laughs> so no. uh, it is real. We do really have incredible an incredible team here at second dinner and they're way more responsible for the success of Marvel snap than i am so uh yeah i just want to call out the yeah just unbelievable talent of the people who i get to work with every day definitely yeah well it as shows. i said yeah, if it shows as i said i think you guys have all made something really great so congratulations and again a big thank you for joining us really appreciate your time thank you thanks for having me it was awesome to be here <laughs> Hey everyone, we have a very special holiday offer for all our FPS users, courtesy of Raycon, between 20 to 40% off site-wide using our special link. So thank you again to Raycon for sponsoring this episode. Believe Raycons. it or not, they're turning six years old. So that's wow. part of the reason why they're doing all these cool offers here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why it's been six years is because they've gotten a rep at this point for offering good quality audio, good earbuds, but about like half the price of other premium brands. Yeah, I use them personally when I go to the gym, like once every six months or so. You know how that is. How that is. Uh, <laughs> no, I do go outside more often than that. I do go outside more often than that. And I always have my Raycons with me. Uh, personally, I think the sound quality is great. The battery life's really good. For me, the big thing is they actually stay in my ears. And this is no joke. Uh, I've said this many times. Most other earbuds do not stay in my ears. They just fall straight out. No matter what tips I use or how I position them, whatever else, the Raycons always stay in. And that's one of the reasons why I love them. Plus, the capsule is actually really small. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that as well? Some earbuds, they're like the capsule's massive and you just can't really put it in your pocket or it's an odd shape or whatever. That's another reason. It's just like fits easily in your pocket. Very comfortable. Love that. Yeah, I use them on hot girl walks, but I really like it because I can keep aware of the road. As I'm crossing it. <laughs> you don't laugh at my hot girl walks. The hot girl walks. Yeah. What the hell I'm is a sorry. hot girl walk? That's just me walking. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> love it. Just me walking Absolutely a target. Love it. That's that's right. <laughs> but there's like the, there's an awareness mode, so if ever, you know, like I can make sure that I'm not completely ignoring the road or if someone tries to talk to me or something, it's it's really good to have. So that's why I use mine. It's got smart functionality, yep. very easy controls, press of a button, make a call, pretty much do whatever you want. And the 32 hour total battery life with the charging case is awesome. Yeah. So uh, look, if you want to grab a pair of Raycons, check it out. Uh, celebrate Raycon turning six with their biggest sale of the year going on now. You can go to buyraycon.com uh, slash friends and use code birthday to get 20 to 40% off site wide. That's code birthday at buyraycon.com slash friends. Thank you to Raycon for sponsoring the episode. Yeah, check it out. It, it just also, we should note it's their birthday. It's, it's not, not our birthday. I know. Like, it's not our birthday. Say, we are birthday, not turning six. For a second. <laughs> It's happy birthday, Raycon. So that's right. Yeah. It, we are, what? Are, how old are we? We're like we're like two and a half, aren't we? How old am I? <laughs> no, we're <laughs> we're almost. Answer that. We're Cut almost. We're Cut almost segment. two. We're almost two. <gasps> and we're back with a user question. Remember, if you have a question for us here on the podcast, email it to contact at friendsbersecond dot com, and we might answer it on the show. So thank you to Shree for this one. Uh, Gerard, do you want to read this one out? Sure. My name is Sheree, and I think I know Ralph's answer to this question already, but what is everyone's perfect podcast games? In other words, games that you play without needing to engage in it fully so you can watch or listen to a podcast while you play. Watch a show or a, listen to a podcast. Mm -hmm. hmm. 
Well, everyone's going to think I'm going to say Destiny. Mm. And I'm going to say Destiny. So that works really <laughs> well. That's like, I'm not interested in subverting your expectations. No, but the truth is, actually, I haven't played that much Destiny lately because I've been so busy with work. I haven't even touched this new season. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was one of my go-tos. But I actually think the best podcast listening times that I had this year was actually when I was playing through Diablo 4 for fun oh. post-review. And I know, again, we've spoken many times about the fact that everyone shits on Diablo and everyone hates it, but I had a really pretty good time with Diablo when I was playing it. And that is the perfect podcast game, man, because you don't have to pay attention to anything going on in Diablo, man. You were just running around, clicking on shit endlessly, totally mindless. So, yeah, I actually smashed some audiobooks and some podcasts during the whole Diablo 2 period when I was hitting it really hard post, post-review and I was just playing it for fun. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really perfect for that actually. So double mm. four, uh, people shit on it, but it's good mindless fun. I think mm. don't take it too seriously. It works. Good mindless fun. Box quote. That's right. Uh, yeah. I don't think <laughs> I have one it? from the last like <laughs> 10 years. I used to play like a lot of Lego games and they were really good podcast games. Um, I mean, maybe Overwatch, but I haven't played Overwatch in like a year. There was just a point. That's so funny. There was that just a point they- where I got with it, where I was like, "I'm in the flow state. I don't need any of this. I don't, you know, I can put something on in the background. Whatever. I'm a gamer." <laughs> that's so funny that you like when you say like oh there's not that many because i guess it sort of speaks to the types of games that you play that require more attention whereas i play so many of those types of games that could fit into that i could have said like in monster hunter Mm -hmm. or the division or like destiny or whatever because i'm like i'm so wired into the whole looter shooter thing where any of those games would be fine with a podcast but yeah obviously if you're playing actual proper video games <laughs> no. that require your attention then yeah podcasts don't work quite well as well you I know just what i mean need my story beats you know that's it i'm saying that's what i'm saying story. like if you're playing games with narrative and mm. like and they, yeah they demand your attention then you just can't yeah mm. so it's interesting i'm fine. Gonna... sorry go ahead no you go ahead i i was just like i'm so i'm i don't I like chill out games, but I don't I don't listen to podcasts or I can't do more than one thing at once. And also, I like to just be in it, man. I'm, I'm a one like one thousand percent gamer. Nothing else. <laughs> I need to be immersed fully. But um, I like in, in reality, like I do rely on sound. I really like sound. I think sound is a crucial part of the feedback for a lot of the games that you play. And it's part of what keeps me going. So like, even if something like I, I could say I'm practicing in Tony Hawk and I'm listening to a podcast, but I don't want to be focusing on that. I want to be focusing on the music, the sound of my board hitting the rail, mm. the, the music, of course, but like course. the combo cues, the little sound effects. Like I, I, I like all that. I need all that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Of course. Absolutely. That's how Man, I keep I ending you. everything I say in this podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I feel you. I feel you. Definitely. For sure. Gerard. I'm going to say... Roguelikes, roguelites, Metroidvanias, um, and randomizers for classic games. Those are just, I get into a flow state. Like, uh, if uh, I, you know, I used to wake up every morning for, for like, like six months and play like a randomized Super Metroid Cross Link to the Past run just to like get my brain working. And I got so good at it that I would like put on a podcast or watch a show. Um, the same just goes for like, Hades or uh, Ravita mm. or um, uh, <laughs> flipping into the Gungeon. Uh, I just love the idea of booting up a game, you're playing it, and it's like completely random element that you don't know what you're getting, and because you're so skilled in it, you just adapt and you it you just get a different experience every time, and you just get into that flow state. It makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're for like your an question. athlete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talented enough to be an athlete, but thank you in that way. I'm not an eSport guy. I think you could be an eSport guy. <laughs> I think I'd be miserable. Not that I mean, like, true. I'd, it sounds like I'd, a tough and life. And also, you're not, you're not 21 when you're out of the game. game. Oh, man, well, that, would, well, that would suck. Well, you just you need to have, like, no respect to anyone who does eSports, the most amount of respect for you. Uh, you just have to eat, sleep, and breathe that game or those games mm. to mm. a degree that, that – it would it would burn me out, uh, and I would not want to ever play that game or any game like it ever again. So kudos to you, mm-hmm. esports people out there who are putting in the work and and grinding to the top because it's 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 a rough one, and we and I recognize you. 
And kudos sure. to everyone who emails us with questions. Thank you so yeah. much again. Thank you, users. Thank you, users. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were all in LA together. Obviously, in the last episode, we had our impressions of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Spider-Man 2. But we alluded to the fact that there was another game that we'd seen that week that we weren't allowed to speak about yet because there was an embargo. Uh, this embargo lifted last week. Um, so you can probably guess what it is. It's Alan Wake 2. So we played about two, three hours of it. And uh, here's what we thought. Suffocating yes. Hey, uh, so we played some Alan Wake early. Alan Wake 2, we got to check out like a preview thing. We all played like what, two hours of it or so? Yeah. Two and a half, yeah. yeah. So, Ralph, you want to go first? Yes, it's it's very good. And I, it's a sure mate, so I'll do these ones. Um, yes, it's very good. In fact, like astoundingly good to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. I really was not, it's very rare that you preview a game and you walk out just being like, Fuck me, that was a good video game. But this was definitely one of those previews. Um, you messaged us three minutes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. This is good. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no honestly. Because and I, this is the thing, right? I wonder about spoilers because I just feel like the sense of discovery that you find throughout this game is so core to what it is. Because really you're just sort of wandering through Sam Lake's imagination and the rest <laughs> of the writing team who've supported him, obviously, and Carl, the game director, whatever. But, you know... Remedy are weird, man. They're really weird. And they're like, well, let's just put this random music number in a unexpected part of the game. And so you walk into this little shack out in the middle of nowhere and there's someone up there singing an absolute banger and you just stand in there for five minutes listening to it because it's so good. You know what I mean? And those sorts of, and there's so many of those discoveries throughout the game because that's what Remedy does. Like mm. you just fill it with weird creative shit that is also simultaneously fantastic. So that is there in spades. And again, I'm not going to spoil a lot of that stuff because that discovery is amazing. But just fundamentally, like as a survival horror video game, that the way that this looks and plays is, yeah, like honestly astounding. Like this, the look, the, the visuals of this, I mean, that when you God we play, yeah, I so basically I slowly walked damn. through the whole I, demo. Told, I was like yeah. looking around, I was like the camera. filming my own E3 trailer as yeah. I was yeah, doing this with I like cam the camera pan. Yeah. Totally, totally. No, like, I got the best footage out of this fucking thing. I you know? walked everywhere. You're yep, usually totally. in a video game, you eventually you kind of get a little bit bored. You start sprinting, sprinting yeah. and I was like, no, I've never I'm spent so much time looking at a floor as I did in the dark place. Me? Looking yes. at reflections and being like, totally. Yep, that checks out. But even like <laughs> walking around like the the, the the city and like all the, the garbage on the ground, like the ground clutter and everything. And just the whole, every inch of it just pops with a level of visual fidelity that very few games are able to achieve. And it's like every single frame of it is that. It was we like should probably say that we did, there's two yes. different demos. Yeah. There was a uh, Saga mission, the third mission, uh, local girl, and then there was an Alan mission. So she was in Watery. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Watery. Yeah. And then uh, Alan's in the dark place in the New York uh, room, room six six five. Yes. Um, and that was. It was just like a like a noir <laughs> city that just yeah. it's a it's a city that's that's built on that like cliche or whatever you want to call it. And Steeped in noir and totally grime. like steamy and black and shadows and graffiti and like you, you end know, up in all a hotel. the Art Deco hotels and yeah. all that shit, you know, full oh. House of Leaves and also The Shining in there. All of that. So the, in the bathrooms of the hotel rooms, it's a green uh, yeah. like bath set, oh, yeah. and there's a big curtain. With I was like, if there was right a there. naked woman <laughs> behind that, I look behind every I single behind one. Every single I was like, looking for a blowjob bear. <laughs> that guy, I was like, where's that guy? Oh, for context, this is the official Alan Wake poncho. Yeah, well, we were wondering. You're wearing yeah. it. Uh, you're wearing, it, you're wearing it a little bit yeah, differently. Yeah, you put it on backwards. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> is the that thing, how they wear it in the game? The thing is, as well, you also told us not to say anything, so... Yeah, we were just sitting there we quietly were waiting abiding. for you to put it on. I was trying to do a bit. Yeah, yeah. It was a good bit. I liked it. Yeah. You, um, you smell so bad. It does, yeah, the poncho, right? It's not it, good. The, it's, get, get in on this. I'm good. Um, <laughs> it's it smells so awful. Yeah, sorry. Man. But there was okay. there was one section of the demo where the first section of the demo was actually in this town of Watery, but it actually kind of leads into this amu <laughs> this amusement park 
which is out in this swamp. And it's called, if you are wondering <laughs> why Sam Lake is doubling down on coffee so it's much. It's called Coffee World. And coffee it's Land, is coffee it? Coffee Land. Land. Yeah. It's like a part of coffee. Yeah, like, it's, yeah. Like, yeah. It's, a, it's a game they have like the, called, like the Espresso Express, which is like the, latte, the percolator. The yeah. percolator. They've got all these rides based on coffee. And it's weird, but also amazing. And but visually as well, because you've got these sort of like these rides that are lit up out of neon the parade lights. Mm-hmm. It's like totally. a good balloon to it. Yeah. Like through the woods. It, yes. Excellent, excellent video game woods. I'm a it looks, for oh, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Really that good. area looks like the Pennywise is like um yeah. kind of like circus area in, yeah. in the new version of it. It was just really cool to walk around. Hundred percent, yeah. Because event when you get in it's like completely silent and then you start hearing the taking. And like combat for me was especially coming off, you know, control, where it's way more sort of balls to the wall, you know, blasting through everything, you've got powers and everything. Stripping it back. Yes. Every single time I heard something i was like oh shit okay what, <laughs> yeah. what have i got you still got the light mechanic with the mm. the flashlight yeah. torch um you know like getting rid of that barrier of darkness, yeah, darkness yeah. and then as well i forgot that they teleport yes oh, and yeah. so that messed me up i died like a, a good oh, couple times while i was like lot. getting yeah. used to it and because you cannot take many hits no no you dodging. really can't it's challenging and it's tense it is. Yeah, it was. It was cool. one of the nice touches. I think is really, really. It's it's perhaps the best example of them taking Alan Wake mechanics from the older game, reinterpreting them and making them work in a survival horror game. Mm-hmm. Is the light system where you can use that, but it's very ineffective from distance. Mm-hmm. Yes. So if you want to, you know, do the resource management part of it with your battery, you have to get up close. At which point you risk like getting, getting hurt because they can teleport and also they're very like erratic yeah. so i love that once i realized that oh it's way more effective if i'm up close that kind of like intricate balance of tension yes. versus risk and reward i was like oh they figured this out yeah, they got it a lot easier as well yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. your reticle bloom is massive yeah and so and if you're just like blind firing whatever like it's such a mess so yeah like you really have to be willing to hold your ground and get up close same thing with uh like jumping to the the, the sequence where you play as alan wake it gets even more survival horror tense because there are certain enemies where they're not worth burning resources on, but yes. you can't really tell. The game doesn't. So you're like, oh shit, oh, I shouldn't use the battery there. Yeah. Oh God, what do well, I do? Like, it's Sometimes they'll let you walk past them and then sometimes yeah. they'll like clothesline you and yeah. like yes. knock you to yeah. the ground yeah. and you're yeah. like, oh. And they're hiding in like the shadow and yeah. you won't see them up until they reach out from it and you're like, oh. Yeah. It's a really creative way of keeping the through line of like the, the original Alan Wake combat, <laughs> but like modernizing it, making it a little bit more interesting, a little yeah. bit deeper. The best thing I would say is like, if it's uh, Resident Evil remake combat and yes. Alan Wake, like OG Alan Wake had a baby. And yeah, but yeah. Look, I mean, yeah, OG Alan, OG Alan Wake. I mean, yeah, the, well, the, only that, Alan Wake, that's, that's <laughs> Al, the, the only thing that's really carried over, I think, is the dodge and the flashlight. Yeah. Mechanically, it feels totally different. Well, yeah, oh. yeah but, like, I, so, but I mean, like the, the main thing is like you're, you're flashlighting and, and then gun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it just feels... A million times better now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it feels, feels so great. much weightier. And there's yeah. so much more to it. Yeah, it makes sense dodge, now. Yeah, you're like, like, oh, this is how it should have been from the outset. Yeah. The uh the shadows remind me from uh, remind me of Ghost. You know, like the the, the movie Ghost. Oh mm-hmm. god, you know, I, thought, like, oh, I thought you meant like, like Ghost from Call of Duty. Man, no, no, don't worry, no, we'll no, get no, next time. All the reference. Yeah. No, and Jesus also Christ. older than that too, but like yeah, because when they're like coming out from the shadows and they're trying to pull you down, that was that. And so I actually found those villains really creepy and i think like i think survival horror villains or like enemies or whatever you know it's like to get it right is hard mm-hmm. because you had your zombies and we've got lots of those we've got your generic monsters like oh it's got lots of fangs and pustules on it whatever but like this is like shadows and they're there and they're kind of looming and shuffling and they can all of a sudden like teleport on a dime past your shoulder and like you need blink. to flip around like yeah. just like they're a very menacing uh, kind of uh, enemy but also that one that like connects with our psyche quite deeply because mm. like we know what a shadow is like mm. we the monster is just this made up thing but shadows we know what they are and they're kind of scary and to have them like take form like that in this world I just think they've really nailed that part of the enemy design framework and yeah I found it so fucking scary. I had one encounter that I'm like 90% sure was a bug, but it was terrifying. <laughs> so like I did the uh, the uh, flashlight on one of the enemies and it popped the shadow, but from the shadow, another enemy fell out of yes, it. Yes, I had the same. I, I was yeah. like, yeah. what? Is, is it not like, a bug? Oh, no, what okay. do I do? Because then I was like, 
what is yeah. going on? Yeah. This is insane. And I was like shitting myself looking for this other enemy and it yeah. just never reappeared. There's, yeah. there's not like, a quick oh, turn, panic. is there? There's no, what's there? There's not a quick turn. No, I didn't Maybe there one. is, but, but I, I, I didn't find I it. Didn't figure it out. Yeah. Well, if, if there is, I didn't use it. But it was like every time they would zip past me, it's kind of like the dread like, oh, of yeah. turning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The audio design is really good. Cool. You could hear them like yeah. like breathing as they pop. Who's that one who was on about sandwiches? Oh, yeah, the sandwich guy. There was... Yeah, there was other. There was another guy who was just like talking about stuff that they like to do as a shadow, mm -hmm. and I was like, "This is very strange." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in terms of like the action, just leaps yeah. and bounds ahead of original elements. Yes, but sure. the stuff that got me, the investigation stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yes. my god, I'm gonna be such a little pervert for it. <laughs> yeah. I pervert. love. Pervert yeah, no. singing and perverts. That's the. That's, that's from the last episode, but yeah, yeah. Um, like picking up clues. Putting them within the context uh, on Saga's investigation board. Profiling people is also oh, really yeah. cool because yes. she sits there and she basically thinks about it and then they do the cool shadow mm. projection, projection thing. Projection yeah. thing. And yeah. it's so yeah. cool. Yeah, th there was also one storytelling technique they use where like to advance the story, you kind of have to go into like a little booth or an office and you look through a pane of glass and then... With the echoes? Yeah, the echoes. Yeah. 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 So it does not always a pane of glass, square. but in this instance it was. And you'd see like Sam Lake, you know, appear there on this glass. Yeah. And but like real life Sam Lake. Real life Sam Lake playing like, a character. And like it's just the f unfolding on the glass. It's yeah. really well shot. It's like a shadow and then a light. Yes. And you have to like get behind the shadow and have it like superimposed exactly. over the light. Yeah. And then it becomes like a moment, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is really cool. So the biggest thing I can say is that it's like the saga stuff and like a lot of people have seen they've put a lot of videos out there for saga. that's very much like what you expect it's pretty straightforward the allen stuff is buck wild it's that's where they're doing really weird stuff yeah that's like and, and just i just again i can't stress how good this looks like i don't know what you'll actually we'll we've got to record all our gameplay yeah and we don't think there's any restriction on what we can show. And so we'll be able, we'll be able to see some stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah, sure. But like, I don't think anyone's ready for just how good this game looks. I, yeah. Just, yeah. I, I wasn't. And I've seen trailers and whatever. But until you actually see it in the flesh. Yeah. Again, like graphics is one thing, sure. And it really does well there. But just like the design of what they've done, like the art design that underpins these worlds is just like, like crazy. The yes. thing, I mean, you know, diving into Remedy Connected Universe stuff too, yeah. it's like, the places have such personality, especially like wow. in Watery and from obviously in you know, Bright Falls and, you know, Deer Fest and like all these little motifs that are around and nothing felt, I think this is crucial because it's a video game where it's like nothing really felt repeated. Everything yeah. felt very oh, bespoke yeah. mm. yes. and placed. And like when, you, when you're in the gift shop, for example, like doing that safe thing, like the level of deal on that was insane. It was. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah. yeah. But rewriting reality as well. Yeah, yeah. Like I was yeah. going to say, mechanically, mechanically speaking, I think that it has a lot going on. There's elements of it that feel like simple things that you would do in other games that have been like um, given a layer of like obfuscation and they're complicated slightly like you want to solve a puzzle you need to go to a different room, you got to go to a board, you got to place a thing there and it on paper it sounds like it's going to be a pain in the ass but it's executed so well mm. and it and not only does it execute well it's executed in a way that plays to the strengths of remedy in a way that it shows how much confidence that they now have in themselves and what they do so like when you open like the mind palace it's Which is instantaneous it's instantaneous Every time yeah. I did it, I was like, it's, in Jesus. it's instantaneous yeah. to the point where if you are running forward as saga and then you hit the uh the mind palace button the final part of the running forward animation in the previous carries forward. So you can tell like that oh, wow. it's like going like that That's and like nice. putting you in. That's it's really clever. But like the way that they do it is like, it's, it's in, in on paper, it's like one too many like layers to get something simple done, but it works in the concept that they have so well that every time I was like, I'm gonna go to the mind palace and look what this is, it's like a joy. You're like, oh, this is so good. I feel like a detective. And they're hitting that true detective yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. inspired well, like, yeah, by- You feel like a detective. Yeah. There's a really nice loop of solving the puzzle, like seeing the red string go on the board. And yeah. when yeah. you've collected all the clues, like a little green post-it note appears, so you know you've done it. And then with Alan, obviously, he is a writer. So being able to change, that's my stomach. Yeah. I burped, no, that oh, was you me, that was me burping. my stomach <laughs> oh, right. um, And with Alan, like the being able to rewrite reality, like being in the ballroom um, in the hotel, I'm not gonna spoil anything like story-wise, but like you can have an event 
there, yes. and then it again just changes. Like you see him typing and everything. Yeah, just the trickery swaps. of it is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I need to rewrite this scene, and it's like tick tick tick, yeah, and the screen flashes, and then you're in a different scene. Yeah, yeah yes. like every time he writes it, is every time he he finds something, he always comments on. It. He's like, yeah, well. This will move the story forward. Yeah, yeah. I love his voice, by the way. Yeah. It's so good. The clicker yeah. as well, like very oh, impressive. Cool. Yes. I think yeah. that's really cool. Like you can capture light into this thing. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a artifact of some sort. Mm -hmm. In Alan's world, in Saga's world, it's just a clicker. Mm -hmm. um, and you go and you use it in certain spots and it just will change. Just a clicker. That's an yeah. object of power. Oh, it's an object of power, 100%. <laughs> um, but yeah, it changes the world like in an instant. It's very, mm -hmm. very, very cool. Yeah. It's also yeah. nice to see like more of the supporting cast as well so yeah. tim, tim breaker yeah. sean yep. ashmore hanging out um yeah. and obviously you know no, the singer yeah the singer the singer, the singer. The singer. The singer. Oh, the singer. Well, i mean everyone knows who it is yeah, do they yeah. know oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's already been yeah, 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 this is in the ign footage yeah, so it's in the ign yeah. i haven't seen that footage yet. um cool. also yeah, can i be like i'll be the one to gush because like i feel like it's like i've been holding back but like sam lake out there leather jacket tie James McCaffrey's voice, God tier. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, that's I like, I'm yeah. like, I agree. It is very good. I hate to like overly gush, but like for that, like I gotta. Totally. No, Speaking of that, is there anything that you guys think you would see that, you know, like, any negatives so far mm. or something that could crop up? I, I would say the only thing was like, something it was a bit of choose, yeah. some of it was a bit of choose yes. sometimes in terms of like, puzzles and things where to go and what to do and like i was told talking to the team afterwards and they're like oh well actually in that part of the demo of when you're in this part of the world you've already been here before so you actually kind of know where you, you might need context, to go this yeah. time around oh, okay. versus before where i was yeah. kind of wandering around and going the wrong direction and also like it took me some time to learn how this whole rewriting of the story mechanic worked and i got really stuck for a long time because again we were dropped into a part of the game where that would have already been tutorialized mm. and so whatever so outside of that though no, no. Yeah. I had the same thing where it's yeah. like the, especially during the final Alan Wake segment, it was like I started to reach a point where I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. I'm like running around in circles and I'm not sure. And I spoke to them and they were like, yeah, we, we kind of like need to put some, cause it is like, it is like weird logic happening in this game. And yeah. you're like, you, yeah. and you have to be able to communicate what you need to do without breaking that weird logic. So I imagine it's tricky to get that right balance, right? But they were like, yeah, we need to add some steps in between to kind of nudge you gently in the direction. Yeah, Like we figured it out ourselves eventually because it's like, we kind of are able to put them ourselves into their minor. We also played a bunch of these games before. And so we could do it, but I think for the average person who's just like picking this up they'll need a little more like you kind of maybe should look at this and then I mean, maybe if, if, yeah. if they have ps help or something yeah yeah but i, like, I, I expect know. they'll like they'll introduce a few more like sub mission stuff where it's yeah. like go here first and then here and then here and yeah, you'll be like oh i get it a b c d e f because i did like the I, I yeah. did kind of like how it was challenging and also mm. not very handholdy yeah. yeah but yeah. i agree like there has to be a line because it's, that, it can be there rough was a because tutorial it's so yeah. in menu, but I didn't yeah it. i think it's tricky because also like being confused and trying to confuse the player yeah, is a core have have part of the game. Yeah. Like it's like you're there's moments where like you enter a room and it's a loop and you're back in the old place. Yeah. And then that kind of blurs when you're actually just running around the same location yeah. over and over. You're trying to figure out where you're <laughs> yeah. at. You're like, is this supposed to happen? What's going on? Yeah. Like, yeah. I would say as well, like one thing I would flag is like, because I played on PC, I definitely had bugs in my playthrough. Mm. Now, this is a work in progress build, very standard obviously and there's always like changes made up into launch whatever so you know of course at the same time definitely notice some things and yeah. uh things that weren't deal breakers but enough that i was like okay well i probably need to keep an eye on this at launch so um you know if the rest of the game holds like this cool fine it's gonna be great as in like there'll be some issues but you know like none of i don't none of them are gonna stop you from having a good time mm. but um but if the rest of the game is perhaps a bit more rickety than what I experienced here, then I'd be like, oh, okay, that's a bit concerning. So mm. like b bugs is definitely something on my radar. Yeah. Again, not a major concern, but just something that I was like, well, I've seen enough that I need to pay attention to this at the review time. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the writing's great as well. Like they are- They also said it's long. I think this yeah. is longer 20 than- 20 hours. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 we played for like Which two and, like, and a half, three I hours. I can't like, think of a survival horror game other than- Alien Isolation, which I comes close to the, that. The Evil Within was pretty beefy, right? Uh, yeah. I don't yeah. think it's I mean, 20 Alien hours. Alien Isolation but, was great yeah. for the first 10 hours. Well, that's right. the thing. Yeah, because that was 25 in total and everyone's like, ah, it was too long. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, but, with this as well, it's like two, like the two stories, yeah. two stories intertwined, but also 
very different vibes yes. in kind of both like sagas was very small town quirkiness very true detective and then in alan's stuff just sheer like mm. i was more nervous playing the dark in the dark yeah, yeah. And, and like was, yeah, yeah when we we talked to sam lake about it and i was like oh how do you balance the humor and, he and, was I, like, and he's like did you didn't you didn't think that bit i'm not spoiling that bit in the in the hotel was funny and i was like no, so I was actually was very nervous funny. while I was watching it. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's also like a bleeding effect that they're clearly building up where like, yes, Saga stuff is more realistic, but also there's some weird shit that starts to happen in Saga stuff yeah, that you're like, oh, this is much weirder than I expected. So yeah. I came away thinking they are truly in their bag with their stuff. Like they are leaning into it. I feel like Control gave them a crazy amount of confidence in themselves. Yeah. And like, this is the result of them and Sam also said it in our interviews, like, I'm so glad I didn't, we didn't make this game many years ago yeah. because it all, all the struggles and the lessons we learned allowed us to make what we're making now. Yeah. And what they're making is a v extremely remedy game, which is Watch really exciting. every TV <laughs> yeah. advert oh, so funny. that you find. I was so laughing. Good. Listen, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Listen yeah. to the radio. The radio is great. The radio yeah. is messed up, but it's great. Some um, incredible performances from that cast as well. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Very so excited absolutely. to get hands on the final product. and Yeah, man. For real. See what's mm -hmm. up. Because I mean, October is busy. Yeah. We've got like um, Assassin's Creed. We've got uh, Spider-Man. Spider -Man. We got Super Mario. Don't care about any of it. We got Alan Wake, baby. Alan Wake. Like, Alan Wake, baby. I mean, <laughs> I feel probably like something else. There's definitely probably, yeah, probably yeah. Like something else I forgot. But I yeah. mean, like for me personally, I think Alan Wake is like the thing yeah, that I'm just really, like really focused on being mm -hmm. like, this going to be pretty special. So, yeah. yeah. So to be continued. Yeah. I apologize for not contributing to this conversation. I did not play Alan Wake. No, no, I'm sorry. That was all right. No, I'm sorry. And I also was being rude with being on my phone, but I had to fire to put out of yeah. a personal situation. Unfolding emergency. So yeah, Alan Wake, man, it's uh, it's good shit. I was pretty blown away. Very um, mm -hmm. very excited about that one. Hope they stick the landing. Mm -hmm. You guys sure? I suspect they will. I suspect they will. Never say. You, you guys never. got so Trust much. No you guys got so much love for your individual coverage of Alan Wake 2 by Sam Lake and the crew. That's so cool. Oh, that was nice. That was nice. That was yep, really that was cool. I did feel like when Sam Lake tweeted me some a bunch of like flame emojis and love hearts. That's I'm the like, most oh my God. I've ever seen him Sen give anyone. Senpai noticed me. I'm feeling pretty special right now. It's pretty cool. Max I Payne himself I tweeted at I me. <laughs> I, I wish I could have made it, but I couldn't make the, the preview. <laughs> Did I tell you? I can't remember if I said it in the preview, but my biggest revelation from the Alan Wake event is learning that Sam Lake actually owns sweatpants. Okay, I can't imagine that. Right? I thought he would no. just sleep in a, a three-piece. No. So that's a big surprise to me. Right? Yeah. I still can't believe so, it. And he has like a special mold that he puts on his head at night to protect the hair. And so when he wakes up, it just... And he's just like, Perfect. that's how it goes. You gotta do it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there are a bunch of other games that are coming out uh, that I think we should talk about. I'm oh, sorry. There's so, there just too many games, guys. There's too, too many, many video games, games man. It's it's too stop much video games. There's too much shit on me. There's too much shit on me. I mean, so we've already obviously spoken about Mirage there. I mean, so we've got Forza, Mortal Kombat, Cocoon, and Cyberpunk. Who's been playing Forza? Anyone? No, but I really want to. Yeah. I actually got sent a review code by Microsoft and I've been so busy that I didn't get a chance to boot it up. And I'm so sad about it because I actually really like Forza games these last few years. Like I'm actually getting more and more into driving games. And that one just looks really nice, obviously, because it's kind of like the pinnacle of technology and mm. sound design and all that stuff. Like it's just the, I mean, obviously with Gran Turismo, sure. And, and I'm not enough of a racing a racing aficionado to be able to discern the differences between the two at a minute level. They both look spectacular. Um, and I just think I would really have loved to have um, got stuck into to Forza. So I do I have it installed and I plan to just muck around on it when I get the time. Um, but yeah, no, unfortunately I haven't had the chance yet. Mm. Mortal Kombat? Around. Muck around, man. Muck around. Muck around. You guys don't say muck around. I'm with don't you, Ralph. Don't do the Australian accent, it. Jake. We've been through this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, Mortal Kombat. You played Mortal Kombat, though, didn't you, Jake? You did the, oh, yeah. the campaign, right? Yeah, man. Did we yeah, talk about this already? I can't remember. I, I can't remember. Can't remember. Can't remember. Already. Did we talk about it in the last episode? Really? Or I, I don't did. know if we did. I feel like we did. Didn't we? I feel like we did. Yes. We talked about playing Forza a little bit. Oh, um, okay cool oh i didn't know that Yeah, i talked about it, really kind of the same stuff i said on the podcast a couple weeks ago when i previewed it uh it 
is uh, good. <laughs> it's like a racing <laughs> game. Uh, you, the cars look good. Cars go fast. Um, I am interested in how they changed up the progression model. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if all thing. fans are going to love it, and I, I'm still curious to see like how it plays out long term because I'm only scratching the surface. But I like that they rethought that. And the only other question I still have playing it because at this point they haven't figured out tires on the road, physics, cool, all that accessibility no. options sense of speed they have all that for years now but um it's it's how this game progresses as a platform i um, i want to wait and see uh because it is now just forza motorsport it isn't forza motorsport 27 or whatever oh i see what you mean sure it's going to be continuously added to and updated over time okay. so i, I really want to see like how that goes i don't know yet mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense, right? Like, do you need a new Forza release every two to three years? I mean, I think not necessarily. To get a tired, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, if you just have a really well maintained car game, and everyone's like, well, "We hate live services," it's like, well, I have. I'm always said, like, I don't hate d- live services so long as they're handled correctly. And if there's like a car live service like this, and the monetization is reasonable, and they provide excellent service to people who really enjoy it, then fair enough. And if they just continue to build the game over time and have cool, interesting events and add great new cars to it, like yeah, sure, like that makes perfect sense. Like go for go for your life, turn ten. Yeah, flight I mean, simulator keeps people happy, keeps specific nerds happy for years, mm-hmm. and Absolutely. they add to it, they do things. So Forza can try and do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just hope it doesn't go the way of what was it, Drive Club? Was the other one? Oh, that's right. That was the Sony one, right? The that was the Sony, Sony one. one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they just. But I think they, they, just, they messed their monetization a, up a bit, didn't they? I don't know. It's also, that's two racing games in Sony's category. Like, why would you maintain two games like that? And it's like, just, they're going to have to choose one eventually. And obviously they cho- they're they going to choose Gran Turismo every time. Mm. So uh, it does make sense. Yeah. yeah. From movie, gamer so. to racer. <laughs> I still can't believe that that's a thing. Has anyone seen that movie, by the way? Has anyone seen Gran Turismo? No, not yet. No one I, I know not, has no. seen that movie. Did anyone see that movie? I did, anyone in the po- in the comments below, please tell us I if you saw this movie and it. what you thought. Because I've seen, read reviews or whatever, but I don't know. That's a bit hit and miss with yeah. film. So was it good or not? Like I genuinely am interested to know. So I don't. Yeah. You tell you what is good though. Find some liberty. <laughs> Oh shit! Because we couldn't there talk about there this. There it is. There we, it is. We couldn't mm. talk about it in the last episode. Yeah. Uh, damn. Damn. Some hot shit. I loved it. That was yeah, yeah, totally, totally. What, 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 uh, what really rung out for you? Like, what, what did you love about it? I just think that, like the. I I don't want to spoil it, but there is a level or like a mission towards the end where it just completely flips on its head. The yes. game. <laughs> And like yes. it just it just goes for something, uh, and I think it ultimately like really succeeds. Like it it it's obviously you know it's the RPG. It's the first, it's the first person RPG stuff, and then at the end it just strips back and does it goes for something. And I'm desperately trying not to spoil it because I think it's a really cool moment. Um, so I think that it bit is. at the end. But I think as well, honoring spy thriller. I think they massively succeed. There is the party that I was talking about when we interviewed Gabe in the last episode. Where it's basically they do the whole James Bond thing and they do it so well. Like approaching uh, Alex, who's basically uh, M. No, Q (laughs) from James Bond and like going through the gadgets and like walking through how you're going to infiltrate and how you're going to meet Reed when you get there and who your target is. And the twins as well. That was such a cool mission when you were with the twins at the um, the casino table. It was really great. I think it's just full and also of what that moments. set up for the future, yes, the future mission with the twins is, was really great. Yeah, super cool. I think it just set up all these moments, and I think it just reminded me why I really loved Cyberpunk when it first came out. Um, I just think, yeah, the, all the changes they made in two point oh. Mm. I feel I feel like everyone has been saying this ad nauseum for the past couple of weeks, and we're a little bit behind the curve because of the way the shows lined up. And so I'm not going to go on about it too much, but I loved it. I love being back in that world. Mm. all the new music all the changes to the gameplay the characters of phantom liberty i was just like man I dog, just, town. Ah, dog town dog town town man dog town. super what a great, great space. location me too did you guys yeah. do the, the the mission at the fun fair at the theme park no that was one of my favorite ones it's, I it's, it's, it's just a I, side I, mission but it's it's okay. just a really what, nice in al- dog town yeah and it's nice like a nice character moment there's a theme park in Dogtown? Where's a theme park in Dogtown? Uh, like, kind of 
Is it up the top, north. like up high, or is it north near the ish? area where you can only walk, or the other end? Uh, so you know, I, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll I, show you on the map. I can look it up. But it's I'll fun. look it up. I'm All right, just gonna cool. double check that it is a, a theme park. Uh, it is just a okay. Phantom Liberty mission. Uh, but it was really great. Okay. I like. Yeah, cool. Did you guys see the? Uh, it kind of has like a Far Cry thing mm -hmm. where you can just like fail at the very beginning. Yeah. Of yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. I, I yeah, love cool. just like letting Keanu Reeves come in and be like, well, you you really fucked that up, you piece of <laughs> shit. Like, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> and I yeah, like that yeah. there was so much more Johnny Silverhand. Like, I actually yeah. like the little interesting bits they did with him this time around. Oh, wait, this isn't a Phantom yeah, I... Liberty one. In that case, ignore Okay, me. I was going to say, what is the nonetheless. theme park? Well, which character is it with, does it involve? Johnny Silverhand. Oh. I've done. Oh, back in the day. Is it? Oh, I, think, I didn't realize it was from the I, base game. I guess I, guess I'm I did all the Johnny like stuff. He's like in Dogtown, so I was like, oh. Okay, yeah, right. Interesting, yeah. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, obviously I reviewed it and did like a 52-minute review, so I feel like I've said well and truly <laughs> everything I have to say about this game. Uh, but I really loved Phantom Liberty. But more than anything else for me, it just kind of reminded me how much I loved Cyberpunk, like the base mm. experience. That was what really... Because I played through the whole game again you know when i did this review and experiencing it again i was just like this is such a special world to be in this is such a special cast of characters uh the things that cyberpunk gets right i think it always got them right from the start and i liked update 2.0 don't get me wrong i really think it does deepen the rpg side of the game for sure and you know now it's got like car combat and that's great and like there's a whole bunch of stuff that i think meaningfully improves the experience and like tightens the screws on a bunch of stuff that was clearly very broken like skill trees for example were completely foobar before whatever but it really realistically i'm at that point in my cyberpunk journey where that really didn't make that much of a difference for me because i was i'm like I've, i know what i'm there for it's this ca these characters and this world and this story and the vibe of just cruising night city that is what cyberpunk is to me and update 2.0 didn't touch any of that stuff because you couldn't really improve on it in many ways like if that stuff was already kind of like so uh, i know that's like a, a perspective that it pisses off a lot of people it's hard to talk about cyberpunk to this day you know because a lot of people are still mad about it and not fair enough i get it you know definitely not going to defend any of the just like shit city project red pulled yeah. but i really feel as though this playthrough made me realize just how right they got so many of the aspects mm -hmm. from the like from the jump, you know, and that had the game not been such a busted <laughs> experience at launch in terms of all the bugs, that um, yeah, it would have been it would have had a much much better reception. Mm -hmm. um, well, obviously that's a dumb thing to say, but you know what I mean. Like I think oh. those those elements that really worked, I think people would have been able to see those a lot better, and you know, I think that would have been great because those things really do deserve to shine um, a lot more than they got the chance at launch. So yeah, mm -hmm. Jake, did you play it? Yeah. How'd you find it? Oh, I really liked it. Yeah. It's cool. I think the best part for me was Dogtown. Uh, again, like mm. I just, I really liked it as a location. I thought it was just mm. really, um, like it just felt very like what I always pictured cyberpunk in my head. Like when you hear about the concepts or you, 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 know, you flip through the rule book where it's just a giant shit show and <laughs> that's what it really felt like here more than anything and the fact that like every area is detailed like you know in night city you'd come across a stretch here and there of like highway or big main street where you never really wanted to get out of your car it just looked cool there wasn't really a lot going on i feel like dogtown had a lot more moment to moment just like packed with shit mm -hmm. and cars on fire and civilians doing some mm -hmm. weird thing and like a tunnel and like what just so much going on that like that was really the, the biggest thing for me, I think. That and... Was, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, Dogtown's basically like uh, Hill Valley in uh, Back to the Future 2 after Biff gets the almanac. Yeah, or like <laughs> escape, from, <laughs> escape, from, escape from LA too. Like big, big Kurt Russell vibes there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. It is and very I cool. Didn't, I didn't, I don't, I don't, Sorry, Jake. Sorry, Andrew. I was going to say, I don't know if I told you. I told you guys, but uh, I, I ended up going to the cyberpunk party with ben star uh the Friends week of the game cool launched it was really cool uh idris alba showed up mm -hmm. he was really <laughs> oh, that's so cool he was what amazing did he have 
the what the standard that? one that he has. <laughs> the one I don't I don't know accents or dialects <laughs> oh, regionally. Lucy's Lucy. so fixated oh, on it at the age of Elba accents. So can't well, get it's over happening it. To me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I I ran into our friend Gabe. We just interviewed mm-hmm. him. Uh, and he gave me codes to Cyberpunk, Yay! so we go. I'm I'm gonna start playing when I finally go home. <laughs> so have you actually played? You haven't played? You haven't played the base game? Like you've never played Cyberpunk before? I I played a couple hours of the base game when it All first right. launched in in uh, 2020. I played it on my PC, and I it just didn't work very well for me. Sure, so, sure. Um, I would love to see your perspective on Cyberpunk. Actually, like the completionist perspective on that, playing it from start to finish, all the yeah. all the ch- like achievements. I think that'd be really It'd be really cool to see your take on it. So I don't know if you I, have the time, but it'd be cool. I'm I'm thinking because I have so many games lined up from now until November, but I'm thinking about trying to maybe sneak it in in, in December. So sure. we'll see. It's a big game, it's like, but I it's I'd like, love to. It's like probably I reckon it's probably eighty hours to complete. Yeah. I would say about that in that ballpark. Maybe a bit more now with Phantom Liberty. Probably maybe ninety ish, but it's not like ridiculous it's not completely unmanageable so you could definitely knock it over in a few weeks if you sort of yeah. chip away at it um but yeah oh yeah for me it's been good playing through it because uh you know played it in the early days had some issues with it here and there of course uh but then i was also going back every year for every significant update like 1.5 was a big update so game ranks would want to do like hey cyberpunk one year later cyberpunk two years later so it kind of became like a thing i would just dip my toe in and see how it was technically you know coming together on consoles platforms and stuff like that but then it kind of detached me from actually like what the game was so jumping back in again and mainlining through phantom liberty kind of like reminded me like oh yeah this this can be pretty cool again like ralph what you said like sins committed in the past very much worth punishing but (laughs) it's a it's a net positive that now it is a cool and good and solid game just like any other game before it that has fucked up and become a cool thing no man's sky people wanted to like have a class action lawsuit against Mm -hmm. yeah sean and, and hello games and stuff but now it is fantastic. And again, it's always like a net positive is there's another good, solid package of a game in the universe. Yeah. Mm, totally. Yep. I'm, I'm a big fan. And like, obviously the sequel, they're working on it now. It'll be a long ways off, but um, really interested to see what, how that goes, man, because what, what I'm you, keen from not to dive. What do you want from mm. the sequel? I don't know, man. Honestly, it's going to sound really reductive, but like if you just gave me the same sort of thing again, but you tightened up like the to the sense of decision making that was going on, right? Like as in right the way through, because Phantom Liberty has some good decision making, by the way, like you can really affect outcomes of your decisions. If you made that a meaningful thing throughout the rest of the game, uh, if you tightened up the RPG systems so that like, because right now there's a lot more in there, but it's still quite messy. Like there's a lot of just stuff going on a lot of perks a lot of whatever um if you kind of made that tied up more interesting in terms of the builds you could create but then if you just had the same city with the same sick storyline the same cool cast of characters i'm kind of happy like again i know that's not a particularly interesting take but like i just really love what that is and i'm interested in another story I actually just want more Night City. Like, I don't, it doesn't need to be a different location to me because I still think there's so much that could be extracted from that location. Um, but yeah, a new cast of characters, new story. And I guess as well, like a deeper exploration of themes. That was the other thing that I'm really quite keen on. Because mm. I think personally, I don't think Cyberpunk says a lot. A lot of people say, look, if you read all the shards, lore entries, it does. Fair enough. That's probably true. I don't read all that stuff. I just read some on occasion. I just know that the thrust of the quests what i'm doing most of the time isn't saying a great deal and it's not particularly thought provoking but i think cyberpunk as a like as a setting has a lot more to offer in terms of themes and messages and ideas and so i think any sequel that gives me more choice deeper rpg and a better exploration of those themes while still looking fucking incredible offering sick action that's cyberpunk 2 for me baby sign me up I'm, i'm all in on that you know so i don't know what about you like how do you feel about that question i want it to be nastier and grosser mm. i want it to be grimy yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. i would love the same city but i would like to see it in dire straits i'd like to see capitalism the infrastructure is just kind of being shown to be even worse and i would love for them to really explore 
maybe like through you, the character, like really experiencing like cyber psychosis and like uh, being yes. addicted mm. to drugs and cybernetics. Like just no, really please, no, no, no addiction. It will be banned in Australia then. We can't do that. So anything, <laughs> just ignore oh, that. Oh, no. <laughs> no, our ratings, our ratings board is like super sensitive to anything to do with like drugs and addiction in video games. Oh, no. So. I know it sucks. I'll have to no import, it. I'll import it. I'll import it. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to fly to. I'll fly to Boston. I'll fly to Boston. We can play it there. Boston oh, or man. Chicago? Or Chicago? Which oh, Chicago. <laughs> that's right. That's the, the the Chicago famous setting of the town. That's that's right. No, I agree. I mean, there's so much. <laughs> I'm moving us on. There's so much interesting <laughs> shit to pull from from uh, cyberpunk, like red and whatever. Like you could even go back in time with it to the corporate war or like even the collapse yeah but true, but then you'd true, kind of true. lose a lot of like the the cybernetic sort of things but there's so much there's so much cool stuff to that i would really want them to pick up on and i don't know like i would be happy being a different merc ha- helping yeah helping some of the different factions like there are all these gangs and like maybe you're the person who is you you get to pick which faction you side with and bring them to power in night city or whatever or maybe you decide to fuck everyone over and go corpo or something i don't know it would be cool i'm just i'm very cyberpunk pilled at the moment so any sure. crumb that they'll give me yeah yeah that's it i'm the same i'm the yeah. same i'm like i'm really down i'm really down i just want to play as one of those dudes that you see in the very beginning of the base game where like his face is yeah a robot but he's still a <laughs> guy like how does that work so- yeah true <laughs> that's sick. true um in terms of like another great game am i the only one who's playing this one cocoon so. yeah what is this you know what jake that's a great question <laughs> um <laughs> sorry should i said what's this about then what's all this then no <laughs> <What's> all- <laughs> uh okay so it is a puzzle game by some of the team who are behind uh from play dead who were behind limbo and inside and oh it's yeah it's oh. exceptional and i'm struggling to explain what it is you play as a sort of <laughs> bug type creature and it, very, it starts off very simply it's kind of no no speech or anything no nothing guiding you you just walk around and then you activate switches or find power sources and power switches or you interact with a giant i can only assume it's some kind of plant in the environment and you basically gradually figure out the language of the world not not as in a speech language but as in like the game language of how it works and then you use that to open doors and then you go between different worlds you sort of there are these pools i guess and you and you put a colored ball in them and then you kind of use that to go into a different sort of layer of the world. I don't know. I'm only... So th- one of the things I really enjoy about the game is that it's very short. I'm 25%, 29% of the way through. And I can tell you that because that is how the game tracks the progress. You go in and there is a circle and that tells you how far through the game you are. And if you want to go back, if you're stuck, so if you want to go back to the start of a puzzle, you go back by percentages. You don't just reload a save you basically hmm. turn the clock back to a different, like, percentage-wise. Really? It's really That's cool. That's kind of weird. Yeah, it's okay. It's really, really right, cool. Sure. And it's sort of this nature meets mechanical vibe. And I'm really struggling to explain it because it's just a really smart, intuitive puzzle game that I'm not very far into. So I can't tell you what the hell the story is about, if there even is one. I had one boss encounter that was really cool and it was... It reminds me of, I don't know if you played The Last Campfire, but it's that no. kind of vibe. It, that, that's by Hello Games, and that was one of my highlights of 2020, oh, honestly. Okay. It was fantastic. Um, it's just vibes-based puzzle game, and I think it's awesome, and I will have finished it by the next time we get together, and I will be yelling at you all to play it. It's on Game Pass, PC yeah. and console. Music's, like The sound work is great. Mm. The visuals are so striking. The, one of the things for me is that the character feels so nice to control. Uh, there's no jumping or anything. You just interact with one button and you use it to drag things. And like, it's a really good weighty feel when you drag things. And when you're solving puzzles, it just feels so, so satisfying. And I'm probably doing a terrible job of explaining exactly what the game is. I'm just implore you all to try it. If you have Game Pass, it's 20 bucks on Steam, I think. But it's one of, it's a little, it's a little gem. It's a little gem. It does look, 
Yeah, it, it does look hard to explain because yeah, it's like, the it's, way it's, it's shifting perspectives. Thing? It's kind yeah. of like, yeah, like you're sort of, it's almost like you're shrinking and then because you're smaller, you're now access this new layer, you know, that you... And then some of, of them like, you get yeah. flung into yeah. as well. Okay, right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just like, I don't know, this layer is doing, it's great. Mm, yeah, it does look very cool. And what, like four hours long? Yeah. I, can, I can do that. Four. It's like a single sitting. Yes. Yeah. So I played an hour or so last night. Um... I really dig it. I yeah, I'm kind of there are so many games right now that are threatening to be very, very big. I was I was genuinely very happy with Mirage being I clocked in at 13 and a half hours when I finished it. This mm. one, Alan Wake's gonna be like what, 20 plus? And so I'm just like, yeah, just need Yeah, a they little, did say that, yeah. Just need a little little in between game. So I'm playing mm. Cocoon. Yeah. Nice. Anyway. Gerard. Good pick. Hell. Thank you. Hell yeah. Uh, Gerard, I know you've been playing something that you can't talk about just yet. Have you been playing anything else? No, guys, I finally am finally inching my way through, mostly because of the podcast and you guys. Thank you for the support, uh, uh, you guys. Because seriously, uh, next week's game that we're going to talk about uh, only happened because of literally Ralph um, just hooking it up. So thank you, Ralph. Um, no worries. But I'm... I'm very excited to talk about that game, but mm-hmm. unfortunately, embargo wise, we can't talk about it yet. That's we're allowed to game. say that we're playing. Yeah. We're allowed to say that we're playing it, though. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we're allowed and to that... say that we're playing Spider Man. Yeah, <laughs> guys, I, guys, I got Spider Man Two code. It's Yay. very exciting. I'm very excited. Uh, yeah, so I can't wait to talk about that next week um, or in a another in fortnight two in yeah. two weeks. Um, but that's all. I've been playing that and Tears of the Kingdom as I'm winding down finally in my journey of Tears of the Kingdom. I'm about to finally, I think I'm about to beat Ganon, and I'll have nothing else to do after that. I have like subsequently Yay. completed every single thing in the game. Oof. Oh my god! Uh, I will find out because apparently I've found out that if you beat Ganon, it gives you a percentage of how much of the game is completed. So it's gonna I suck will... if it's gonna be like you've done seventy four percent. No, it'll have you six hundred hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gonna yeah. be Final, it's gonna be Final Fantasy ten two all over again, where it's like ninety nine point oh, nine eight, and I'm like, where is that O oh, two? Where is it? Where is that point O oh, two? Uh, mm. But yeah, that's all I've been playing. I, it's, it's those two. I've been kind of going back and forth. So, um, but I I and I really wanted to play Mirage, but I know everyone's. Everyone's playing it right now or is about to play it. So I've, I've got guys, there's too many fucking games. Stop. Too stop it. I, I just want to live. I want to breathe. <laughs> I want to see my family. I want to good problem to have. Yeah. It's a it's, yeah. It, it is, but I also like to, to do things. <laughs> I like to go outside <laughs> sometimes. Uh, it's pretty overrated doing yeah. things I found. I learned that a long time ago. Well so, ag- agree to disagree. Uh, shall we <laughs> shall we then go? And look back, Gerard, if you want to take us to This Week in the Way Back. This Week in the Way Back, we're looking at uh, the exact week, I guess for you guys watching uh, or listening. It's it's about the week of October 5th uh, in that zone and range. I will go first. Uh, I'm, I'm, let's see, where, where would I, guys, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so October 4th, 1995, the Super Nintendo a sequel that no one asked for, but now everyone loves to hate it because of that particular noise. I'm talking about the one and only Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, in which you play as Yoshis trying to get Mario to reunite with Luigi because they are babies and you get them from the stork and it's very <laughs> cute and it's very annoying if you lose baby Mario because he cries, but... It's the sequel no one asked for, and let me tell you, if you want to have a, a real weird time, uh, look at the commercials on YouTube for the game. It's very weird. Uh, but I love that game, and it came out 28 years ago. Which I don't want to. Th- I don't want to. I don't want to think about that. Uh, Jake, what do you? What do you got in your plate? Oh boy, 17 years ago in 2006, crazy things used to happen with intellectual property because we got the Scarface video game. Scarface, <laughs> the world is yours. It was the time of Grand Theft Auto clones, and they said, fuck it, let's do Scarface, Tony Montana. And it's actually a pretty fun arcade shooter in an open world. The concept is, what if at the end of Scarface, 
where Tony Montana was famously gunned down and killed to death. Uh, actually, <laughs> killed was to still death. Alive. He, is su- that, he is that really the game? That's the plot. Oh yeah, my it takes God, place I after. I didn't know that. He That's survives. He great. wakes up and he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then you just have to rebuild your empire from the ground up in a crime simulator Grand Theft Auto game. Great. So it has combat and shooting and you build up like a balls meter or a cojones meter (laughs) and it's kind of like a rage meter and then you can activate it and then you're kind of like invincible and you have infinite ammo and it's kind of like say hello to my little friend mode where he's just like i fucking uncle you all assholes and he he just starts cursing at everybody and you get to shoot everybody uh also it had like driving and shooting combat while driving you could i'm pretty sure you could like dual wield rocket lot like rpgs while driving and you're like convertible and like shooting dudes it was crazy. Yeah, the games like this are not made anymore. <laughs> no. Dude, so D- David David McKenna wrote this game. He wrote, to give you guys an idea, he wrote the screenplay for American History X, Get Carter, Blow, Bully and SWAT. Like this is like a yeah, oh I would say it's God. Like on that level, but they t- <laughs> Wait, they tried. Wait, was Al Pacino in this? Oh, I th- Oh no, archive archive footage. Robert no, Loja was. weird about games. Ice Tea. Well, he was, was like, Roger he was Ebert, like, like video like games he, cannot be art. Ricky <laughs> Gervais. What? And uh, Tommy Chong. Oh, Cheech and Chong are in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, fu- here's the fun fact. We have to go fact. back and review this game. Pacino did not reprise the role of Tony Montana in the movie, in the game. He did, however, allow the likeness to be used and he got to pick who played him um so yeah he he's His in butt there in archival <laughs> footage andre sojaluizo sojaluizo um who's also in transformers and you've got mail <laughs> there you go that's quite a game it go. also it go. also came out on the Wii. did not know that oh i didn't know yeah. that wow. yeah it was a big thing it was cool vivendi you know it was a different time. Like we had a Godfather game, we had a Scarface game, you know. Mm-hmm. Reservoir Dogs game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sopranos game later on. Oh yeah. Yep. There was a Sopranos game. I love Sopranos. Mm-hmm. I gotta Man, There's a donkey gotta... video on it. Go check donkey that out. Video is very good. Let me get a pastrami on rye. <laughs> 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 the sandwich bit is so good. <laughs> um, I will say 24 years ago this day, Tony Hawk Pro Skater released on the PlayStation. Wow. It's uh, it's it's actually pertinent because just today, well, on the day of recording, the game, the remake was actually released on Steam. That's parts oh, one nice. and two, which I'm extremely excited about, and I will be picking that up because I don't know what modders are going to do with that. But we're going to do some crazy shit with it for sure, and I'm totally down for it. But um, yeah, man, Tony Hawk still to this day like one of the highest rated video games of all time. And I mean, it's Tony Hawk. You don't need me to explain Tony Hawk. It's just, it's just perfect. There's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's one of the few perfect video games in the same way that Robocop is one of the few perfect movies. <laughs> By the way, there's a yeah. demo for Robocop apparently on the Steam, mm-hmm. on Steam, according to Jake. He just told me about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So excited okay. for that. You got no idea. Okay. Li- listen, Phil Spencer, I know you listen to this podcast. I know you're big on, fans Phil. of all of us. I don't think so, he does. <laughs> Uncle Phil, <laughs> just real quick, since we know you listen to the show. Bring back if you, face. if, if you wouldn't mind, two requests. One, once you're done with your act, your act, your Activision acquisition. Uh, one, please bring back Scarface because we'd really appreciate it. Uh, and two, uh, why don't you kick that uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater three and four? Uh, yeah, in mind. Let, yeah. Let's, let's, Hell uh, let's, yeah, let's, man. Let's, and you know what? You're at maybe if it works out, maybe we talk about Guitar Hero. Just maybe, <sighs> just a the dream. Just, just maybe, just maybe. He's like We'd walking around it. wearing Hexen shirts, and it's like, okay, yeah, sure, fine. But there's a bunch of other stuff I think we should get to first. Hey, Phil, listen, come on, don't man. don't piss on Hexen, okay? <laughs> <laughs> just go play Immortals. Just go play Immortals of Avium. I'm sure that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure <laughs> that'll cover it off. Oh, I'm sure the comment section will love that. <laughs> that was this mm. week in the way back. No, it back wasn't. To you. you didn't do oh, mine. No. You're right. I'm sorry. Oh. You know why? Could you? I'm so Rude. sorry. I'm so sorry. Rude. I'm so sorry. Uh, an often forgotten game, but an absolute banger nonetheless, or at least in my memory, uh, 10 years ago, Enslaved Odyssey to the West. Yeah. I have not seen this game. Written by oh. Alex Garland, starring uh, Andy Serkis. It slaps. It's great. 
Yeah. It's, the, it's one of those ones where I can remember the box art yeah. from retail, but I've never played it. Yes. It's one of those like ones. This, anymore. Yeah. this, this walks God, over that Horizon is Zero Dawn could fly. This yeah. really is, wow. Oh, actually, I do remember this. I have seen this. Because isn't this being remade? <gasps> This is being what? re-released or something. What? I swear to God. Is it? Okay, maybe I'm not. Wait, wait. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Don't quote me. There's something else. Some like some proto, like open world RPG thing, which is getting a remake. Oh no, I don't think this one was ever it's open world. Probably not this it one. It was then. more like hub based. But basically, like the the plot and what is like uh, Andy Circus is monkey, and um, he has to escort. It's basically the whole game is an escort mission, but it's not a bad escort mission. Is that Trip has implanted something in his head so that he has to stay bonded to her and like he basically has to get her through all these levels it's like the only escort mission game that i didn't absolutely hate um oh to me uh antinitis from ninja theory also co-wrote it with alex garland the famed screenwriter behind things like devs and um oh shit what was he in what else has alex garland done Oh. Uh, uh, Annihilation. Annihilation. That's the one. And Sunshine. And he wrote for Twenty Eight Days Later and Dread. Anyway, uh, it's he was really- also he was also a consultant or a story consultant on DMC Devil May Cry. Mm-hmm. He was also meant to be doing the Halo movie from like years ago. So they <laughs> like his name his name was attached to it. Um, but no. Anyway, it was. I remember just falling in love with that game when I played it, and I. Yeah, it was one of those games that just really grabbed me from the get-go. And I haven't played it since, and so I might kind of go back and see, or maybe I should just leave it in the past and keep those fond memories. In my, I don't know how it's <laughs> aged, but it was really cool. And it was nice to see a game of kind of just try something very, very different. And I think overall it very much succeeded. So that was 10 years ago, and I'm going to crumble into dust. Nice. Wait, can we also acknowledge that Andy, Andy Serkis's character is Monkey, and he's played a monkey like a million oh, times yeah. now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. King Kong. <laughs> Uh, uh, Caesar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Gollum's kind of is Gollum a monkey? Oh, go- 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 basically, go- Gollum is he monkeys definitely around. He's monkey, he's monkey adjacent, I guess. He's but the yeah. monkey man. He's the monkey boy. Now, now it's officially that week in the way back. Back to you, Lucy. Thank you. Well, boys, that about does it for this week's episode of Friends per Second. Um, if you have enjoyed the podcast, please leave us nice comments or ratings on your podcast platform of choice. Helps us out a lot. Thank you very much. Um, where can people find you, Ralph? Here. Here. Right here. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. All the time. And sometimes on Twitter, unfortunately. But that's it. How's your threads going? Oh, I mean, yeah. a threads is nice. I post like I post like nice, fun things where I'm like, hey, the sun is shining today. <laughs> that's what threads is for. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, threads grind, is just... Grind angels. Thre- <laughs> <laughs> Threads Rise is nice. It's, it's, it's actually a really nice. It's a nice platform. It's a nice vibe. <laughs> I actually do like it when I stop by there. Versus Twitter, it just kind of feels like I have to be on there because there's still stuff happening mm. there. You know, like news is breaking there. There's discourse going on there, so it's gonna have to reluctantly be there. But like Threads is the happy place for sure. Like f- f- Twitter is the bad place, <laughs> and and Threads is is the happy place. The happy so, place. Yeah. Uh, Gerard, where, are people, where can people find you? YouTube.com slash that one video gamer where I complete games, uh, but I haven't completed, I haven't made new completions videos in a while because I've just been traveling so much. I got a, uh, I got a video on Spider-Man 2 coming in a couple of weeks. You can check out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, in case you wanted to get caught up on all the FNAF games, I have a gigantic FNAF compilation coming out on Saturday, so you can watch me suffer. <laughs> Playing FNAF one two three four and Sister Location. I stopped after that because I'm it's there's too just, many. There's too many, and honestly, I true story. Uh, those games, like I had to take anti anxiety medication and see a doctor after I completed them because uh, they're oh. very. They had Sorry? very difficult. No, th- there's a part of. I feel like a, d- a dumb rec- a dumb person bringing this up. Uh, there's like an online challenge that Markiplier made a long time ago that became like the norm of completion for people, which is called 2020 2020 mode, which is like you set all of the bots in FNAF 1 and FNAF 2 on the hardest setting. Uh, and it's like the jump scares. I had to get so good at the game that the jump scares would constantly kill me. And it like fucked up my adre- adrenal glands and like. I th- it was it was a chaotic time of my life, and I'm glad oh to not God. play those games ever again. I had wow. to go to the doctor and 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 
after I did those, uh, they can't, like, there's even a game called like ultimate, ultimate FNAF night where you can like have like 30 or 40 bots on the hardest setting. It's chaotic guys. You don't, don't watch do pad or whoever don't, don't, don't do just watch other people play the game and live through them. FNAF's fine. The movie's coming out that I shouldn't be talking about FNAF. I've, I've, I've done too much. I've done too much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I yield my time. <laughs> and Jake, what about you? <laughs> I'm gonna be in bed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, take Ben. I'm, take I'm, Ben Broad's yeah. advice. Yeah, I'm still moving, and uh, my place is being renovated now too. So, videos when I can. Uh, Spider-Man definitely complaining about Assassin's Creed Mirage probably. Uh, that's on <laughs> YouTube.com/slash Jake Baldino. Then uh, game ranks during the day before you buy the Friday news show stuff like that. And here, of course, my favorite place. Oh, this is the good place. <laughs> good place. That's indeed. a show. Right? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, we, it we, is. Saw, we saw it the we saw the set. The set. That's yeah. right. We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh wait, Jake, you did not. I'm sorry. Jake wasn't there. <laughs> that's when we visited uh, oh, uh, Hill but, Valley. But we did go to Hill Valley film. instead. So I, yeah. I think right. I think we made up for that. Yeah. Oh yeah, we I never did. posted those pictures. I should do that. Yeah. Find me on Instagram yeah. at Jake Baldino. Well, he'll post the yep. pictures yep. of when we went I'll to Hill Valley. Pictures of that, yeah. Yep. All right, and you can find me on Twitter, Alice James Games, and uh, during the week, uh, you can also find me on Gamespot and Giant Bomb. Thank you again, everyone, for watching and or listening. Jake, take us home. Tie your shoes and go to bed. I certainly am. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>